audiobook titled Building an Army in Another World with My Smartphone, 00-37, by Daichi Senpai. This work belongs to author Daichi Senpai. Source Royal Road and ScribbleHub.com. Prologue. I woke up lying on my back with an excruciating headache. I found myself in the middle of a forest surrounded by a sea of green. It was peaceful and tranquil. However, I wasn't in the state of mind to appreciate it. I had no idea why I was in such a random place. In fact, I couldn't even think of my name. However, it would seem that I still had common sense and general knowledge remain in my head. I got up and looked around me and saw that there was a sealed letter on the grass. I picked it up and saw that there was no name on it, so I opened it. Inside it says, Congratulations, you made it. Now you must be confused but don't worry. This letter will explain everything. As the result of a careful selection process, you were given the right to transmigrate to another world. Right now, you will have no memories of your previous life. But don't worry. We did get your full consent before transferring you over. As part of the transmigration package, you were granted any skill slash power you wanted. However, in your case, the ability you asked for was unique, so it cost a lot more. To fill in the missing amount, you sacrifice your memories to get the necessary points. You've also been given the essential skills, such as auto language translation. You can understand any language, your speeches are translated, and everything you write is also translated. And finally, your power is on your phone. Go check it out. Good luck. What the hell? I said as the letter disappeared from my hand. 18. Chapter 1. I was baffled. Transmigration skills? These were something you would find in an Ice Sky novel or anime. And what power could I have asked for that it cost my memories? What was pre-transmigration me thinking? After I stopped complaining to myself, I pulled out the phone in my right pocket. The phone had no password, no fingerprint or face ID whatsoever. And I tried to look for any photos, old contacts, but there was nothing. There was an app that was just called, and with a white icon. Welcome user. Would you like an explanation of your powers? Yes, no. I selected yes. Confirmed. Your powers include. 1. The ability to create and command automata units. Each unit can have a specific ability, from combat to commander. 2. You can create vehicles and extra equipment. 3. The ability to build facilities from defensive towers to living areas. 4. All creations cannot be refunded but can be stored in an item box. Only buildings, equipment, personal items, and deactivated units can be placed inside your item box. Living things cannot be stored. Please note that limits have been applied. 1. Only weapons before the 1960s are available. However, you can advance the ages by leveling up. 2. Weapons of mass destruction are not available. 3. There is a limit on the number of units you can summon. Currently, the limit is 200 and can be increased by leveling up. I was thoroughly impressed with my choice of ability. Clearly, I was some military nerd of some sort. I'm sorry for judging pre-transmigration me. Would you like to run through the basics of using this app? Yes, no. I hit yes once again, and seven options appeared. Status. Create units. Create vehicles and ordinances. Create supply and equipment. Create facilites. Management. Item box. Zero items stored. This is your main menu. Please select. Create facilites. And build a command center. Note. As part of the tutorial, all creations will be free until completion. I selected. Create facilites and the command center was the first to appear. Here is an overhead view of the surrounding area. Please place the command center in a 35 by 35 area. Note, one square is the equivalent of one meter. I looked at the map of the area and found that I was at the center of a massive clearing in an enormously dense forest. It looked strange and unnatural, but it didn't matter to me. I placed the command center in the area in front of me. The ground gently shook, and a three-floored brick building emerged. The command center looked like a typical government building, with automatic glass doors, windows, and even working elevators. Next, please select, create facilites, and build 3x mining drills. Recommended to place these near high mineral areas shown red on the map. There were a few red spots on the map, so I placed them nearest the command center. These drills can harvest any sort of minerals and refine them to any desired shape or size. Having something that can mine resources and refine it would be helpful. Please build a medical facility, unit recharge hub, living quarters, warehouses for storage and vehicle hangar. The medical facility was a three-floored hospital that was fully kit out with beds, 
surgery rooms and the necessary medical equipment such as x-ray machines. The unit recharge hub contained many pods, which I can assume the automaton units will use to recharge themselves. The whole roof was covered in solar panels, and many beware signs were put up everywhere. The warehouse, well, was just a warehouse that was about 100 by 100 meters. I placed those on one side of the base whilst the living quarters were on the other side. Like the warehouse, I placed the vehicle hangar close by. Finally, I built three types of houses, three medium-sized houses, two large houses, and one large apartment building. Please create 150 combat, 10 medical, 10 logistics, and 10 command staff. Personnel equipment will be adjusted to match the present situation unless specifically adjusted. I did as instructed and selected the correct numbers of units and abilities. A bright light shone in my eyes, and the next moment a group of automata with no faces appeared. All the units were automata meaning that they were not living beings. I guess they would be like AI androids. Their bodies were like humans, but there were sections where their limbs would connect to the main body, and their skin was a light gray color. They had magazine holders and secondary weapon holsters as part of their bodies. The combat units were equipped with L1A1 rifles. I realized that only one automaton had a face out of the whole group. She had pale white skin, a great body made of metal, and long silver hair. She stepped out of the orderly line and saluted before saying, Supreme Commander, I am Ayumi, the leader of the first combat company. I will be serving you to the best of my abilities. Nice to meet you, but could you not call me Supreme Commander? It sounds very embarrassing. Negative, the way we call you is absolute, and cannot be changed. To call you our Supreme Commander is an honor. Um, sure. Having been overpowered by Ayumi's determination to call me Supreme Commander, I decided to let the subject go for now. However, the name does make me sound like some evil tyrant. Supreme Commander, what would you like us to do? Have the combat units secure our base and have some scout the surrounding area. The medical units, logistics, and command staff should go and settle in at their stations and get them working. Understood, I will pass on those orders to the units, Ayumi says before leaving. After she left, I checked my phone. Tutorial complete. Rewards will be issued shortly. 24. Chapter 2. All the units went off to work. Some combat units went to scout in the forest around the base, whilst the rest stayed and protected the base. The other workers went to their stations, the medical units to the hospital, logistics to the warehouses, and the command officers went to the command center. Only Ayumi stayed by my side. I headed over to the command center with Ayumi and sat down in the central control room. The main control room was equipped with relatively modern computers, screens and communication devices. Apparently, the weapons before the 1960 rule did not apply to other types of equipment. I quickly opened my phone to check my status. Name? Level 1. Current limits? Units 90 slash 100. Only arms made before 1960 can be created. I looked through, create vehicles and ordinances, which has the options for military Humvees, different aircraft types, and long-range weapons such as howitzers. Create supply and equipment allowed me to create extra ammunition, weapons, and simple stuff like pens and paper. The list was very long, and some of the costs for weapons were very high. Management showed me a list of all the items, buildings, and other things that I currently have. There was the option for me to retrieve it and store it inside my item box. I turned my focus back onto the base map displayed on the giant screen. Thirty red dots represented the combat units currently out scouting the forest. The map was slowly expanding, and more and more details were added. The units must have some sort of tracking device, which allowed us to see their location. Supreme Commander Unit 7 just reported encountering an unknown species, currently observing it from afar, reported Ayumi. Can we see it from here? I asked. Yes, we are putting it on the main screen now. Video footage appeared on the screen of a giant creature with red skin, holding an axe in its right hand. It was looking around its surrounding as if it was hunting for prey. I immediately realized what it was. That's a minotaur. Unit 7, continue to follow and make sure it doesn't notice your location. Ayumi, call two nearby units to provide support. I commanded. Understood. Within 10 minutes, units 9 and 3 arrived at the location. Unit 7 approached the target with care and tried to make contact. Units 9 and 3 stayed back and prepare for any scenario. Understood Supreme Commander. Unit 7 approached the target following my instructions, whilst the rest stayed back. 
As soon as the Minotaur spotted Unit 7, it made a roar and began charging. It covered the distance and was ready to swing its giant axe down instantly. However, Unit 7 fired its foul with precision accuracy, and with one shot, the Minotaur dropped dead. Supreme Commander Target was hostile and was successfully neutralized. Confirmed. Please bring back the target for analysis, I said. Understood, Supreme Commander, we are returning to base. Whilst they returned to base, I looked at my current status. The bar had only moved up by about 3%. I guess killing things was my way to level up. I then went outside and took a breather. Before I left, I told all the units to try to make contact with any living species and if they were hostile, take them down and bring them back to base. I also took a communication radio device in case Ayumi needed me with something. I could see units transporting boxes into the warehouses from the drills. I decided to check out how the mining drills were doing, so I approached the unit in charge for a report. Currently, we have produced 200 kilograms of raw iron, 180 kilograms of raw silver and copper, and 1 kilogram of gold. Already? That is amazing. But Supreme Commander, what would you like us to do with the excess stone also collected? Put them in storage for now. We might have a use for it soon. I replied, understood. At the moment, we did not have any warehouse worker units, so instead, we had some combat units to fill in the job. To create a unit, I could use any metal which can help with their jobs. For example, using a durable and robust metal for combat whilst weaker ones for non-combat units. I decided to create 20 warehouse workers out of iron and use carbon in the air. The result was a unit made of a robust steel alloy. They cost 10 kilograms of iron to make even though they looked around 1.80 m tall. Again they were all faceless. I left the new units to manage the warehouses and checked out the living buildings that I had built. Since all the units I created did not require food, water or sleep, I wondered why I needed to make several houses. Each room in the apartment building had a kitchen, bathroom, and two bedrooms. In total it can house 40 people. The three small houses had enough space for a family of five and had average sized rooms. The two large houses were not just large. They were like mansions for millionaires. I didn't look at them properly when I built them as part of the tutorial. But I was speechless now that I had a good look at them. Since I was the one who created these, I get to live in one, right? Before I could take a step into the mansion, Ayumi called in through the radio. Supreme Commander Units 3, 7 and 9 have returned with the sample. The Minotaur has been placed in the medical facility to be analyzed. Cool, I'm heading over there right now. Understood, we will prepare for your arrival. I guess the house tour is on hold. Instead, let's check out a Minotaur. 19. Chapter 3. Well, that's a Minotaur, the half-bull and half-human beast from the myths. It had the muscular body of a male human and the head of a bull with two great big horns. By the time I had arrived, the medical units were already taking samples such as blood, tissues and even parts of its horns. I remembered that this was a hospital, so I needed to create laboratory and research type units in the near future. I approached Yumi, who was talking to one of the medical units. Ayumi, have we got anything yet from the samples? I asked. Yes, Supreme Commander, so far, we have a report of its blood sample, said Ayumi, whilst handing me a chart with numbers and letters that made no sense to me whatsoever. Um, I do not understand any of this. Can you explain? Understood. The medical units looked at its genetic information and how its structure varies from other species, such as a human. So we compared it and found that its DNA is closer to bovines. So, what does this mean? In other words, minotaurs are just another branch of the bovine species. Hmm, is there anything else? Yes, the most remarkable thing we found is its horns. The structure is similar to a normal animal horn, such as the keratin layer on the outside. However, there is a certain unknown element we found within them that strengthens the horn. By how much does it strengthen them? Its value is still unknown. However, it is just as strong as some medium to high carbon steels at the current estimate. I thought to myself if we were able to put these mysterious elements into our future units, weapons, and even buildings, they would all improve in strength and durability. Very well, find out this mysterious element, and see if we are to produce them. Also, notify the combat units to find minotaurs and bring them back. The more samples we can get, the better. Understood, Supreme Commander. Grr. That was my stomach growling. Now that I think about it, I have not eaten anything since coming here, and there are definitely no shops or restaurants here. 
Wait, what about the Minotaur? It will surely taste similar if it's close to cows, right? There was only one way to test this. Ayumi, can you get a part of the Minotaur tested to see if its meat is edible, and if so, I would like to try some. Understood, Supreme Commander, and I'm sorry. Sorry for what? Even as your loyal servant, I have forgotten that you are still human and require the basic human needs. Ah, uh, don't worry about that. You are an automaton, so, naturally, you would forget, I assure to Yumi. Thank you for your forgiveness. I then left to Yumi to do her work with the medical units. Ding! My right pocket suddenly chimed. I took out my phone and found a new message. Tutorial reward has been given out. Please check your item box. I opened, item box, and found the reward called, starter vehicle package. Starter vehicle package, the reward for completing the tutorial. This starter vehicle package will help you explore and expand. The package contains five armored Humvees, two armored trucks, and two Chinooks. The required personnel to maintain and operate will also be included and not affected by the unit limit. It's a pretty sweet reward for completing the tutorial. However, the armored land vehicles would have some problems traveling in this dense forest, and the Chinook would require a large area to land. For now, I place them in the vehicle warehouse. The package came with 10 engineers to provide maintenance and 6 Chinook pilots. I'm pretty sure that all the units can operate the land vehicles. I don't remember I have got my license, but I do have some driving knowledge. On the other hand, let's leave the Chinooks to the pilots. I don't even want to attempt operating it. The Humvees can fit 4 people and 1 extra on the M60 machine gun. The armored trucks had enough for 3 up front and 20 at the back, but the trucks could also carry items. Three pilots operated each Chinook which could carry up to 50 people or 10 tons of cargo. The Chinooks had M134 miniguns. However, there's now a new problem. Currently, there is no source of fuel for the vehicles. But thankfully, they were all fully fueled, so for now, we need to conserve as much as we can until we can find a source. I decided to use some of the stones and create a takeoff and landing area and pathways. Whilst I was at it, I also decided to make a wall around the base to fortify it. The land began to tremble like a mini earthquake, and the walls, pathways other structures started to emerge. Supreme Commander, please respond, Ayumi asked through the radio. Ayumi, what's up? There was a small earthquake, and I was worried for your safety Supreme Commander. There are no worries here. My modifications to the base caused the small tremble. If you look outside, there's a new wall. I can see it. It's a splendid wall. Thank you. Is the sampling complete? Yes, the experiments have been completed, and it is similar to a cow. Perfect, I'll meet you at one of the large mansions. We will have minotaur meat. I met Ayumi at one of the mansion's large kitchens. She was wearing a white apron over her full-figured mechanical body and slowly cooking a large slab of minotaur meat. The kitchen was filled with the delicious smell of cooked meat, which made me even more hungry. Ayumi placed a plate of nicely cooked steak in front of me. Supreme Commander, your meal is ready. Thank you very much. I stabbed a piece of meat and popped it in my mouth. An intense flavor explodes in my mouth like a bomb. The meat was so juicy and tender that I ate it all at once. Supreme Commander, would you like another one? I instantly nodded affirmative and devoured a second, a third, and a fourth. This would be the best piece of meat I have ever had, I think. Well, what do I know? I traded my memories for a skill. Ayumi might have overestimated what I could eat and cooked an extra fifth portion. After the delectable meal, I made sure that I complimented Ayumi for her excellent cooking skills. However, she says that she did not do anything special, but I continued to praise her. I looked outside the window and found it was getting late, so I tried to call back all the units out in the forest. But Ayumi insisted that they continue to work during the night since they do not need any rest. It also turns out that they all have night vision-like abilities meaning they can function in the dark. I decided to allow Yumi to do what she wanted, and I went to bed in one of the oversized bedrooms in the mansion, which was equipped with an emperor, 7 foot x 6 foot 7 feet or 2.15 mx 2m, size bed. 16. Chapter 4. I woke up the following day, not wanting to leave the most comfortable bed ever, but I probably had things that I needed to do. The whole mansion was empty. So I went to the kitchen and ate some of yesterday's minotaur meat. Of course, it tasted just as good. After that, I went straight to the command center. However, I saw Yumi rushing out as soon as I arrived. 
Supreme Command I'm glad you're here. There is an emergency. Okay, let's go now. I hurried to my place in the central command room and looked at what was displayed on the screen. Many minotaurs were standing outside a cave as if they were guarding it. The minotaurs seemed to be communicating by sounds of grunting and growls. But that was not caught my interest. There were people bound in various ways going into the caves guarded by the minotaurs. Their clothes were tattered and bloody. They seemed to be captured by the minotaurs, and for what reason, I do not want to know. They all looked depressed, with no light in their eyes. Are you me? How far out is this place? And how quick can we mobile's combat units? We are going to rescue those hostages. The minotaur camp is about 9 kilometers out, and I have already recalled all the combat units except the one at the scene. Supreme Commander, I would like to make a selfish request. What is it? It would be an honor if you allowed to me take command of this mission. I would like to show you my capabilities. Very well, I shall entrust you with command. Use whatever you need, do make sure that the hostage is safe. This is not an extermination mission but a hostage rescue, understood? Understood, I will not fail. I sat back and watched Yumi. To be honest, I was kind of happy that she took over since I don't think I have any experience coordinating a hostage rescue mission. Diamond suit, diamond suit, diamond suit. Third person POV. Combat units 1 to 30 assemble by the hangar. The rest are to stay and defend the base. Ayumi ordered command staff. Contact the hangar. And tell them to prepare the Chinooks. We need four of the medical units to go with them as well. I want to take off in 10 minutes now. Understood. Replied the command staff. This was not only Ayumi's first mission but the first mission ever. Ayumi did not only need to complete the mission. She needed to impress the Supreme Commander. Her only goal was to serve the Supreme Commander, her creator and her master. Less than half an hour, the Chinooks arrived, hovering over the camp. Chinooks take out all the enemies outside the target location with the guns. Make sure hostages are not endangered. The Chinooks opened fire, and all the outside minotaurs were obliterated. The combat units then repelled down the ropes to secure the area and advanced into the cave whilst five units stayed behind to guard the Chinooks. Several minotaurs came outside to see the disturbance, but they were taken down within seconds. All that was left were the ones in the cave. They continued to advance when they arrived at the main area where the hostages were held. There were only ten minotaurs left. However, the primary mission was to rescue the hostages. Ten combat units advanced, each firing and taking down a minotaur, all at once. Command, this is Unit 8. Hostages are secure. Copy that, prepare. Coming from the furthest part of the cave, a beastly roar bellowed throughout the cave. All the hostages quivered in fear as loud thudding soon followed. Command, this Unit 8 unknown creature has been detected. How would you like us to proceed? Continue to rescue the hostages and escort them to the Chinooks outside. Understood. Five of the units went to release the hostages whilst the rest kept watch. The loud thudding came closer and then stopped. This is Unit 12 unknown creature has been sighted, preparing to engage. Coming out of the darkness was a minotaur that was twice as big, and so was the axe it wielded. It roared and prepared to charge forward. The combat units all opened fire at once, but the bullets did not penetrate its thick skin at all. It was enough to keep it busy, as it was blocking its vulnerable areas, such as its eyes. Command, this is Unit 4. All 57 hostage has been released and being escorted out. Boarding is being proceeded. All units still fighting being to retreat to the Chinooks. Unit 4 and others prepare cover fire for the retreating units. Roger that. From the outside perspective, 10 units were aiming at the cave entrance. As soon as the retreating units were seen, followed by the giant minotaur, they began to fire. At best, it did slow it down slightly. However, its speed was still pretty frightening. The units quickly boarded the Chinooks. They took off as soon as the last unit boarded. The Minotaur threw its axe, which grazed the rear end of one of the Chinooks. But the Chinook continued to fly away with minor dents to the door. Command, this is Unit 8. Hostages have been rescued. There are no casualties. Job well done, return to base. I watched the mission being carried out as if it was a game or a movie. However, I knew that real human lives were at stake. That's why it was a rescue mission. 20. Chapter 5. Mina's Story. My life was peaceful. I lived with my mother, father, and little sister in a quiet village near the Abyssal Forest. My father was a farmer, but his previous job was as a soldier. 
he was discharged from the military due to injuries. My mother was the daughter of a wealthy merchant. However, her family were killed by bandits. My parents met when my father rescued her from the bandits and later got married. My little sister, Lena, whom I cherished, was nine years old whilst I was fourteen. We were just a typical working family until they came. It was the dead of night when the Minotaurs raided our village. They rampaged throughout the whole village, slaughtering and destroying. My parents died trying to protect my sister and me. The Minotaurs brutally hacked my father into pieces and severed my mother in half. The Minotaurs took my sister and me along with several other people from the village deep into abyssal forest. There was primarily women, children, and the elderly. The Minotaurs took us to their camp in a cave, and for two days, we were locked in cages and prisons without food and water. There were also other groups of people who were there before or after we arrived. Every so often, a man and woman would be taken into the deepest part of the cave, to be never seen again. We would hear their screaming, and then nothing. This day, there were mysterious explosions, and a group of faceless people rushed in, opening all our prison's doors. We were then guided outside onto these giant horseless wagons that were reinforced with large metal plates. We have all felt a weird sensation, like a powerful force acting on our bodies. The next thing we knew, we were flying in the air, over the trees. This was the first experience probably for all of us. It was scary but exciting. I was surprised that Lena wasn't frightened of the height. Instead, she was very joyous. It had been a while since I last saw her smile. Greetings, everyone. I am Unit 8, and under the orders of the Supreme Commander, we were sent to rescue you. We are now returning to our base, where food and water will be provided. So for now, please stay seated. There will be medical units coming around for quick individual checks. Two faceless people were doing a medical check on us. Generally, a simple checkup by a doctor costs one silver coin each, which is crazy expensive for a simple farming family, and the only thing we have are the tattered clothes that we are wearing. There was no way we could pay them. Excuse me, I am medical unit 3. I will be doing a quick medical examination. Am I right to assume that you are sisters? A feminine voice pulls me out of my thoughts. I looked up to see a faceless person, just like the others. They have grayish metallic skin but this one had a more feminine look. Yes, we are. I am Mina, and my sister Lena. And how old are you? I am 14, and my sister's 9. About this checkup, are we able to refuse it? I asked. Unfortunately, the Supreme Commander has made it compulsory to ensure that no sickness can be spread amongst the rescued hostages. Please do one on my sister. We don't have any money, but I will pay the fee, even if I have to sell myself. I realized that I had shouted the last bit out loud. Everyone just stared at me with a surprised expression. But I meant what I said. Now that it is just my sister and me, I have to take responsibility to provide for her. Thankfully, I am a young virgin girl, and my looks were okay. If I sell my body to a brothel, I should be able to earn enough money. Please don't misunderstand. We will not be taking payment for the medical examinations. This is the goodwill of our Supreme Commander. Thank you. I managed to let out. I felt a sudden relief rush over my body. For now, I did not have to sell myself to pay for the medical examinations. I felt truly thankful to these people and the one they call the Supreme Commander. To have all these things must mean they have a lot of power. Medical Unit 3 used a needle and extracted some blood into a see-through tube. Then something was wrapped around our arms which gradually got tighter until it started to feel numb. It was a strange and confusing examination compared to what doctors would typically do but we all went along with it since it was free and compulsory. Medical examination is completed, for now. However, the blood samples we have taken will be processed back at base. Like everyone else, both of you are malnourished and severely dehydrated. Please make sure you eat and drink plenty when we land. We all nodded our thanks, though I think my sister was still holding back her tears from the pain of the needle. I held her close, assuring her that it would get better soon. Thank you, everyone, for complying with the medical exam. We are about to land, so please stay seated. Announced who I assume is the same one who made the previous announcement. I looked outside the window and saw a massive clearing coming into view. There were rows of grand buildings and houses that only nobles and the very rich would live in. Even the wall that surrounded the whole place made my jaw drop. This is the Faceless People's Home. 17. Chapter 6. The hostage rescue mission was a success. But one thing still bothered me, 
the abnormally large Minotaur. The 7.62 mm rounds didn't affect its extremely tough skin, but maybe something like the .50 BMG or explosive ordinances might do a lot more. Since 57 people were arriving, we quickly prepared some food and water, all hungry and thirsty. Thankfully Yumi suggested having the units hunt overnight, and now our storeroom was filled with meat from rabbits and wolves, and there was even a giant red bear that weighed over 1,000 kilograms. I had to build two huge walk-in freezers just to fit all the meat inside. We all started to prepare the food since there was no fruit or vegetables. The meal consisted only of meat. Considering all the medical examinations, the medical units suggested that all the hostages were severely malnourished and dehydrated. But for now, it would have to do until we can find any edible fruits and vegetables. I had all the medical units take blood samples from each of the hostages mainly to see if they had any illnesses they had contracted back. Ayumi and the other units wouldn't be affected, but I would. There was that weird case where a girl promised to sell herself to pay for her sister's examinations, which caught me off guard when Medical Unit 3 reported it. When the Chinooks landed, I stood with Ayumi and two of the combat units. The units got off the Chinooks, then lined up in front of me and saluted. The hostages watch our display. Congratulations, we have completed our first ever mission with perfect results. For now, the medical units should return to the hospital and analyze all the blood samples. The combat units 1 to 10, please stay here and supervise. The rest are on patrol. They all did as I commanded, without even thinking twice. It's one of the benefits of having loyal non-living soldiers who never tire out and need food or water. I turned to face the group of hostages. There were mostly women and children in the group and few males. All of their faces looked starved, so I had to make my speech quick. Hello everyone, I know you must have had a terrible experience with those minotaurs, but don't worry, you are now safe. We have lots of food and water prepared for all of you, so please wait in line over there, and we will hand them out. They all followed my instructions and moved to an open grassy area. The Chinooks, especially the one grazed by the giant minotaur's axe, were then moved into the hangar without endangering any hostages, and maintenance could begin. Currently, we are using the Humvees to tow the Chinooks into the hangar, so I would need to create some tow trucks soon. The hostages were surprised when they heard the Humvee's loud engine. We bought out the roasted meats and large water tanks and cups for them to use to drink. Surprisingly, the houses had solar panels for electricity, but long pipes led to a large water source deep underground. The latter is what Ayumi answered when I asked her about it. Ayumi and three of the combat units began giving plates of food first to the children, then the elderly, and finally to the adults. There were problems with people cutting in, and a fight ended before it started. With the combat units all around, the fight subsided as soon as one stepped in. I made the combat units remember the rowdy ones since they can remember many more things than my human brain. Out of everyone, one young group of nine people drew my attention. All of them shared similar qualities, blonde, and were extremely beautiful, even the males. Four of them were males, and five were females. One of the girls noticed my stare, so I gave a little wave, but in return, she looked at me with irritation and anger. I wonder what I did to offend her. After feeding them all, I gave them some time to relax so that I could go off and read through the report from the medical units. There were 24 males and 33 females. 15 of them were under 16 years old. Six were over 50 years old, and the rest were between 17 and 49 years old. What concerned me the most was that six of the children had no parents or relatives here. When the medical units asked, the kids started to cry. So we can assume that they have died. For now, we needed to sort out rooms for people. Thankfully the report also included a list of families and partners. I decided that the families would have medium houses. Whilst I would get everyone to partner up and share a room in the apartment building. Whilst I was doing that, I disturbingly noticed that one man had slaves instead of any relatives or acquaintances. I then found eight girls who reported the man as their master. I stood up and called out the slave master's name. I am looking for someone called Jilet. Please show yourself. As soon as I said the names, a group of girls in really worn out clothes shuddered. At first glance, their clothes looked like they had suffered similar damage to other hostages, but these rags that they called clothes were tattered, and the girls were shaking. I assumed they were the slaves and their master should be nearby. I spotted a man who was trying to avoid eye contact with me. 
I moved towards him and gestured with my head to the nearest combat units to follow. You, what's your name? Erm, it's Alan. Hmm? I quickly scanned through the list, looking for an Alan on the list. There was, but it says that he was only 12 years old. This one looked over 30. Perfect, I was looking for you. Please apprehend him. I commanded with a smile as the unit moved in. W8, my name's Jilet. I'm telling the truth. He quickly panicked and tried to correct it by telling the truth. But then he realized that he had fallen for my trap. Those slaves girls you have will be confiscated and will not be returned. Slavery is not permitted here. And since you did not know that, there won't be any punishment. Wait. No, those are my most prized merchandise. My business will fail if I don't have them. I want to speak to your leader about this now. Leader? Yeah, that's right. This supreme commander you have been talking about. I'm sure we can work something out. Now go get him. Oh, that's right. I haven't introduced myself, so they don't know who I am. He probably thinks that I'm just low-ranked officer or something. I guess I can play along for now. Very well, I replied and grabbed my radio, Ayumi. Please prepare the meeting room. I have someone who wants to talk to the Supreme Commander privately. I will be bringing Mr. Jilet and his company over. I noticed relief on Jilet's face as we walked into the command center. The automatic doors scared everyone, and I didn't even want to mention what happened in the elevator. Let's say one of the girls had an accident. Jilet was about to hit her when I told him that fighting was prohibited. I walked into the large meeting room and saw that Ayumi was already waiting. The meeting room consisted of two sofas placed opposite each other, and a table. Ayumi was wearing clothes that made her look like a charming secretary. Wait, where are these clothes coming from, and are those glasses? When did we have materials for glass? Jilet sat on the sofa whilst his slaves stood behind him. I could see him grinning whilst staring at Ayumi. He was very cocky, as if he was an important customer speaking to the manager to fire an employee. Don't worry about this. I won't tell your supreme commander of your mistakes as long as I get to have a turn with that beauty over there, he says as he points at Ayumi, who doesn't even react to his comment. I felt a wave of sudden anger flare up within me. I sat down opposite him and finally introduced myself. I am the supreme commander. Now, what did you want to do with my assistant? I said in a cold, stern voice. 20. Chapter 7. I sat opposite Jilet, the slave merchant, who had gone completely silent. So, what did you want to do with my assistant? I repeated. You um, and my apologies, please forgive my remarks. Jilet began to sweat. It reeked since he had not been clean for a while. I was pretty sure that the girl who had the accident smelled better. Actually, I wonder how the elevator cleaning is doing. Very well then, as I said before, those slaves will be confiscated. Slavery is prohibited here and that's that. This is theft, and plus, this land belongs to the Sorenth Empire. Once they know that you have built a base on their land, they will send their army, he argued. Sorenth Empire? We have set up our base in their lands if he's telling the truth. We only have a hundred units for combat. We can probably take down a couple of hundreds of melee soldiers if they work together. We lack knowledge of this world, and it would be better to set up in unoccupied lands. You know, I have some connections with a commander within the army. If you let me go with my slaves, I can probably convince them to give you favorable conditions on your surrender, he offered. I ignored his words, and Ayumi sighed in frustration, probably at Jilet's stupidity. I wonder where he keeps getting his arrogant and delusional attitude from. There's no need. Units take these ladies to the mansion and have them cleaned up. Ayumi, please show them how everything works. Understood. While I am away... I would like two units to stay by your side. Very well, send two units to accompany me. Jilet, you can go now. This meeting has ended. P please, at least let me keep one slave. I need the money to pay off my debts. I know, I'll take that young one right there. Jilet points to a slave girl who looks around ten years old, and I couldn't help but feel disgusted. That was the last straw. Units take him away. I'm going to build a prison now so you can throw him in there. I took out my phone and built a small prison on one side of the base, away from the main area. For now, I have no idea what it looks like, so I will have to trust the app. I could really see the fear in his eyes as he was being dragged away. Is this what it feels like to have power? I couldn't help but laugh wickedly, which scared the girls. Oops, another just had an accident. Better get out of here so that it can be cleaned up. After that whole issue, which could have taken less time, 
It took so much longer since I decided to have some fun. I returned to the place where the hostages were relaxing and chatting. It immediately went quiet as soon as they noticed me. They must think that something must have happened with Jilet and the slaves. I guess I need to explain. As you may have heard, Jilet was a slave merchant. Under our rules, slaves are not allowed, so they have been taken away from him and taken care of. Jilet, on the other hand, chose to resist. He is now kept inside a prison. Many of the people sighed in relief. Some guys looked at me with a bit of discontent, so I made sure to have them watched by the units. I needed to make sure that this place was secured. I split the hostages into groups and showed them how everything worked inside the house. I got several surprised reactions. Some were ecstatic at the luxury of the rooms. Everyone, please get a good night's sleep. I would like to conduct a meeting with everyone attending, I announced and left. I had the families in the medium houses, and everyone else partnered up. Those who were alone were put together with someone of the same gender. I had units hidden around each living area to catch anyone attempting to sneak out or do something they were not supposed to. I want to filter out all those with immoral intentions for the first couple of days. I headed back to my own mansion and realized that having a 10-bedroom house might be too much for me. I took a hot, comfortable bath and went back to my room. Waiting inside my room were three of the slave girls waiting naked on my bed. What the hell? I panicked and slammed the door shut. Simultaneously, Ayumi came over with four cups of water on a tray. Ayumi. I said as calm as I could, why are there three naked girls in my room? Hmm. I followed your instructions and took them to the mansion to be cleaned up. And why are they here naked? You did not specify which mansion, so I assumed you meant yours. Ugh. But that doesn't explain why the girls are naked. They personally requested to service the Supreme Commander. I have verified their intentions and have checked that they are all virgins. What the hell? I was speechless. I had so many questions that could only be answered by the girls inside. Wait, did she says they're all virgins? Anyways, I went back into my room with my eyes closed. Okay, please cover yourself with the blanket on the bed. Make sure that everything is covered, I said. After the rustling stopped, I opened my eyes, assuming they were all covered. These three girls looked to be the older girls from the group of slaves. The left girl looked around 21, the middle around 18 and the right looked around 15. The girls were beautiful in their own unique way. The left girl looked more refined and mature with her light brown hair, and despite hiding under the cover, I could tell that she had two giant mountains. The middle girl had blonde hair. She looked like an attractive rebellious girl, and her chest seemed pretty flat. Finally, the last girl looked like a high school girl, with bob brown hair and a bigger chest than the middle girl, but not as big as the oldest. Wait, no, that isn't the point. Please tell me why you are in my room, naked I asked, and the left girl answered. As a slave, we are treated worse than livestock. Our group of girls were going to be sold in the capital of the Carinth Empire to nobles and brothels. And since we are all virgins, our previous master treated us better. I understand that, but why do you want to serve me? This time the blonde girl spoke up. Once you are made a slave, you can never get out of slavery. Our future was either becoming sex slaves to nobles or a slave prostitute at a brothel. As soon as she mentioned what their future would have held, she started to cry. This world is making me sick, especially these people who enslave others. Wait wait, please don't cry now. You are safe now, I said panicky. I know we are making a selfish request, but please don't lay your hands on the other girls. They are young and innocent. Please defile our bodies instead. The older girl carried on. It finally made sense. They were willing to sacrifice their purity to save the other girls. They were commendable for willing to sacrifice themselves for others. Of course, I wasn't going to do anything to them in the first place. The other girls were around 9 to 12 years old. Only those with twisted minds would lay their hands on them. I assure you that you do not need to sacrifice anything. You are free to live as you want now. If there is a home you wish to return to, we can take you as long as it's within our capabilities. All three girls shook their heads. My entire town was raised down to the ground by the army of a nearby lord. I managed to escape with my younger brother, but Jilet killed him when he took me. My father was the lord of territory, but his advisor stabbed him in the back and took over my house. My father and brothers were killed, and my mother and sisters were raped and killed. I was away, but they sent people to kill me. I managed to slip away but then I was captured by Jilet. My only family was my father, who was a peddler. 
During our travels, we were attacked by bandits. My father was killed, protecting me, but I was still captured and sold to Jilet. All three girls told me their tragic stories, recalling their memories, and tears began to flow like a waterfall. I started to panic again. I had no idea what I should do in such a situation. I have no memories, and my knowledge only complied of military stuff. Ayumi saw my struggles but decided to not help me. The next moment I found my arms around the three girls. I had no idea what I was thinking. My body just reacted on its own. I was prepared to be shouted at or even hit, but it didn't happen. Instead, I felt our bodies coming closer. The only thing that kept my body from coming in contact with their bare skin was the cover. And then it slipped. 16. Chapter 8. This morning I had many things to do. Sort out what the rescued people wanted to do, base upgrades, and our clothing problem. Last night, I told the three slave girls that they didn't have to sleep with me to gain favors and were now free to do what they wanted. I promised them that we would have a chat later today. The convincing took a very long time, and when I woke up, I couldn't stop yawning. I checked with the units guarding me for any problems that might have happened overnight. But apparently it was all calm, and all the girls were still asleep. It was great that the units didn't need to eat or sleep to function, but I feel that they might need maintenance, and I wanted to see what a unit looked like inside. I looked through, create building, and there it was. Workshop, a place that can provide maintenance and repair on equipment. It can also produce other items. I plan to place this near the vehicle warehouse and create a couple of extra engineer units. I also want to build a laboratory to start properly examining the creatures and plants of this world. I especially wanted to look for plants because my current diet consists of only meat products, and with the lack of knowledge of this world's plants, I shouldn't eat anything without confirmation. I also plan to increase the base's defenses, but these plans would have to wait until I check how much material we have stored. I head down to the kitchen, where the heavenly smell of meat flooded everywhere. Inside was Ayumi preparing my breakfast with great speed. Sometimes I would forget that she was not human because of her behaviors. I did wonder at some point about how these units were almost human-like, but it was just a waste of time. If they were more like robots, I would have felt lonelier. Good morning, Supreme Commander. Today for breakfast is the meat of a giant green wolf, hunted early this morning, Ayumi says as she places the plate in front of me. It smells incredible. What about the other people? Yes, that has been taken care of. I have the units serving food and supervising them. Good, I want to make this place as enticing as possible. Supreme Commander, may I ask why? Well, as a human, we naturally would want to be with our kind. As I said that, I sense the Yumi's expression saddens, and I quickly corrected my point. No, sorry, what I meant was having people would make this place livelier. And also, since I can only make military-focused units, it would be nice to have them provide us with the knowledge we lack. Ayumi who returned to her usual cheery self, nodded at my quick excuse. It's frightening how human-like she was acting, but I didn't say that. If she were human, I would have fallen in love with her at first sight. Wait, does Ayumi even have a gender? Anyways back on track, I ate my breakfast whilst I listened to Ayumi's daily report. The night watch had successfully prevented some people who tried to sneak out, but it had turned out that they were kids who wanted to go to the warehouse to see the Chinooks. They were quickly returned to their rooms. You might be wondering about those kids who have no parents? Don't worry, some volunteers, as well as other families, looked after those kids. Next was that the drills apparently couldn't dig any further. I was shown an extensive list of materials that we had gathered. It would seem like even the warehouse was almost full. I guess those plans for upgrades can go ahead without any problems. The final thing was the blood sample results had been completed. Most of them were healthy but one person actually had an STD. I might need to provide some treatment for him. I think the hospital came with cabinets of medications. I might need to place a guard or two there as well. That wasn't the most critical part. Ayumi showed me a list of nine people who had abnormalities. Apparently, their DNA structure was similar to humans but also contained the same unknown substance in the minotaur's horn. We had no picture of them, so I had no idea what they looked like. Our temporary measure was to watch them closely and put them down should they show any hostility. After eating, I headed over to where the people were with Ayumi. As soon as they spotted me, they immediately went silent. Good morning. 
I would like everyone to decide whether you want to stay or leave. You are free to discuss with your partners, families, and friends. A young woman puts her hand up with a question. If we choose to stay, what do we need to do? Good question. I'm sure everyone had jobs before coming here and obtained valuable skills. As long as you put those skills to use, we will provide food, water, and shelter. But some people, especially the wives and mothers, might not have worked in a while. In that case, we have some simple jobs available. Many of them began to show interest in my offer, and a few who I could see were already sold on my offer. Now, once you have made your decisions, please report it to a unit. There will be additional details taken from you if you choose to stay. I ordered all the units to turn on their camera, which I had no idea where it was, and when someone wanted to stay, a picture of them would be taken. A picture, along with extra details, would be stored on the computers. I planned to make some ID cards for them, but that would mean I needed to create a workshop. I left them to decide and walked around the base accompanied by two units. I took out my phone and opened the app. From there, I clicked on base management and moved the drills that had stopped drilling to another location. The holes were quickly covered and no entry signs were placed. Since we had plenty of resources, I made massive improvements to the base. Laboratory, a place of research and experiments, can produce medications and chemicals. Workshop, a place that can provide maintenance and repair on equipment. It can also produce other items. Armory, storage facility for firearms, ammunition, and other things. Factory, a place for manufacturing goods. Food factory, a place for food production. Water treatment plant, a facility that can turn contaminated water into clean and drinkable. And also two more warehouses. I also connected all the house's wastewater pipes to the water treatment plant. The armory is where all the extra weapons, parts, and accessories will be stored. I needed to make sure that it was heavily guarded and that only trusted personnel could enter. This would be where the ID cards come in. I built factories not only to create more jobs but also to produce goods. I plan to use the food factory to make MRE, which can last over for a couple of years, to be stored and be used in cases of emergencies. It's uncertain if we would lose one of our primary food sources, the animals from the forest, or if we needed to abandon the base and move. So it is best to be prepared for anything. In terms of base defensive upgrades, watchtowers and a giant heavy metal gate were built. I placed four watchtowers in each corner and two between the gate. I set up four M115 203mm howitzers, 120PM 43 mortars, and enough ammunition to go with it. After the rescue mission, my level increased by two. Only my unit limit had increased by 200 so I created 50 artillery crew units to operate all the artillery guns. Furthermore, I created 50 more different units to work in each of the new places I had built. I wanted to consult with Ayumi before making the decisions for the rest. With that in mind, I headed towards the command center. 14. Chapter 9. Currently, I am in the central command room, where Ayumi and the logistics units are working. Several screens showed the camera attached to the combat units, and every time someone wanted to stay, a picture of them would be taken along with other details. I wanted to make a registry and give each person an identification card. Each card would open certain areas where the more trusted people are allowed more access. I also planned to have most doors fitted with a security card swipe machine to prevent unauthorized people from entering. I consulted with Ayumi about this, and she shared the same opinion as me. We decided on a system with four ranks that determined which areas you have access to. Level 1 Normal Open Areas Level 2 Special Area Level 3 Restricted Area Level 0 Top Secret Only me and the units I plan to create an underground area for level 0 type stuff that no one can know about, like those government secret underground bases. Next was what I should create. We decided to have 20 units with the Type 99 Rifle Arasaka, Sniper Rifle, 20 units with the M60 Machine Gun, and 20 Standard Units with the FAL. I also created M1911 pistols, Colt 1911, for every unit to use, including some of the non-combatants. I also made one for me and a couple of extra to go in the armory. Of course, I didn't know how to use it. I headed out to a place on the far side of the base with a Yumi and built an open shooting range. The first couple of rounds all missed, but my accuracy became better as I fired more and more. Next was a Yumi's turn. She hit every single round with headshots on the target. 
Well, of course, she did. She was my top assistant. I spent a couple of hours practicing until I could hit at least five shots out of ten. There was going to be a need for me to protect myself in the future. I then went to the mansion and had a chat with the slave girls, who had all decided to stay. The conversation was very awkward because none of them was wearing clothes, and I had no idea where to look. After that, we returned to the command center. All of the hostages have decided what they want to do. Only three people wanted to leave. They all were men, and they reasoned that they had families waiting for them. So we planned a time for them to be outside the forest. They were definitely going to be spreading the word about our place inside the forest. And if Jilet was telling the truth, this forest belonged to a nation called Sarenth Empire. How they perceived us could determine if there was going to be war. We needed to gather information about the empire. Unfortunately, we had no surveillance capabilities, like satellites or drones. We would have to rely on spies. But all of the units except Ayumi have no faces. Ayumi about. Yes, we do need to gather information about this empire. Whoa, she just read my mind. Good, we're on the same page. About the units? Why are you the only one with a human appearance? That is so that I can communicate with the Supreme Commander better. But all of the units are capable of changing to human appearances. Wait, they can. The next day the Chinooks took off with the three people on board. They were given several packs of MRE filled with only meat and containers of water. The Chinooks dropped them several miles away from the nearest town not to attract any attention. And after the hostages were out of sight, we let our spies out. I had 40 units made with espionage skills, armed with only pistols hidden inside their clothes. They appeared as normal-looking males and females. Their sole objective was to spread themselves all around the country. Unfortunately, we encountered two problems. One was the communication devices, and the video feed system's range was only around 15 kilometers. Over that, it was completely silent. Instead of building radio towers, we decided to station a unit every 10 kilometers and act as a message relay system. Radio towers could be very ineffective as we would have station guards, and they could be spotted by enemies or wild monsters. But I did build one inside the base. The second problem was the units needed to be recharged every two weeks, and if not, they would just stop working. In that case, I could just retrieve them since they are counted as deactivated. But it would be a problem if they needed to be on long-term missions. Currently, we have the workshop working on replaceable batteries that can be stored and transported or a portable recharging device. All this reminded me that my phone has not needed to be charged once since coming here. I asked the people who have decided to settle down here for some information regarding the empire, but only a couple had any decent information. The most common fact was that the Sarenth Empire was all about expanding. It was going to be very unlikely that we would be able to negotiate with them. Now we just had to wait. In the meantime, I looked at what each of the rescued people, or I should call them civilians now that they are part of our little community. We had a decent range of skills, with farmers and hunters being the most common. For now, I gave the farmers each a small plot of land within the walls. Since we didn't have any seeds to grow, I ordered the spy units to purchase some. Once they buy some, I can retrieve them since they would belong to me. I plan to build a greenhouse for farming in the near future. However, we needed to expand a bit more and increase our base defense for now. The hunters would go with the combat units into the forest in groups and hunt. Some of them have knowledge of the types of prey and the different plants inside the forest. Also, all the fur and materials are processed by people who have crafting skills, so that we could use or sell them. There were many children within our group, so several people volunteered to look after them. Most of them were mothers themselves. The rest of the people would help around the base helping out in the factories or warehouse. They were all managed by the units working in those locations. Two or three people were unhappy with the system, and with a bit of digging, it showed that they owned small businesses and had people work for them. But with their businesses destroyed, their best bet was here, so they had no choice but to work. 16. Chapter 10. After three weeks, everything was going smoothly. The espionage unit managed to gather maps and other intel. They've managed to get into the capital city and are conducting more research, specifically on the politics of the empire. I had to retrieve them after they needed a recharge, but they were sent back out within two days as soon as they were full. Whilst back at base, we now have seeds for all sorts of crops. 
but until they grow, we are currently relying on the espionage unit who are buying bulks of vegetables by trading small bits of gold I gave to them, or the money made selling some of our bounties from the forest. We also started to stockpile other processed materials that we could not make ourselves. The hunting has also been going smoothly. The hunters are teaching us knowledge of the forest. We produced bows and crossbows for them to use during hunting which are then returned afterwards. The people who had abnormalities in their DNA were also part of the hunting group. They showed excellent skills with the bow and had an abundance of knowledge about the wild plants in the forest. I decided it was finally time to chat with them, so I called them to the meeting room, which had been cleaned and redecorated. I realized that they were a group of nine people who all looked remarkably beautiful, and there was the girl who still gave me a death stare. Excuse me, thank you everyone for coming here. I would like to have a chat with all of you, I said as I showed them the several sofas that had been put out. I wonder where they came from. Ayumi pours each of them a cup of tea made from the leaves brought in by the hunting group. Now you must be wondering why I summoned you all here, and I think you might already have a rough idea. Indeed, what gave us away? The oldest man in the group spoke up if I recalled correctly. His name was Elrond. When we took your blood samples, we found a difference in the nine of you. They looked at each other in disbelief as I showed them an image of one of their samples and another human. We found the same extra element inside the several monster parts, like the minotaur's horns, but we have no idea what it is. Mind telling us? Each of their faces looked a bit tense except for Elrond, who remained calm. That's mana. I'm surprised you have never heard of it before, Elrond says as he suddenly stands up, which makes Ayumi draw her pistol, and everyone else stands up, all alarmed. Stop, Ayumi, put it back, I immediately shouted. I could tell that he wasn't going to do anything bad, and I am pretty sure I didn't stop Ayumi. She would have fired. Everyone calm down. Now, what were you going to show me? My apologies for my sudden movements. What I wanted to demonstrate was this. Elrin's hand began to glow a light green color, and I felt a gentle breeze brush past my face. Magic? I blurted out. That's right, that thing you showed us in our blood is called mana, which is what allows us elves to use magic. Magic wait, elves? I was surprised, and also not. I expected there to be elves in this world, but to meet one so soon wait, I looked at their ears, but they were shaped like humans. They noticed my stares, and all began to laugh, except the girl who was still giving me the death stares. To be honest, she looked rather cute, but that wasn't the point. One by one, their ears began to glow and morph into, as I know it, the pointy elf ears. It was no wonder that they were good with the bow and knowledgeable about the forest. I felt the excitement swell up inside me, but I had to remain calm on the outside. Ahem, so why have you just revealed yourselves? I asked, still trying to keep in the excitement inside. Humans hunt elves for slaves, so we hid our identities. But the spirits have congregated all around you. Normally they would be with people with strong magic like elves, but they are also attracted to people with good nature. But what if I was someone evil, with strong magic? I returned. If I think about it, what exactly are my powers? Magic was the only answer I could think of, but Elrin shook his head. I sense no magic power coming from you at all, and even most humans I've met so far have at least a tiny amount of magic flowing. Wait, does that mean I can't use magic? No, you can't, was the reply. I was slightly disappointed. But then again, I have guns and overpowered soldiers. Well, thanks for letting me know. You are free to my words were cut off by a sudden report from Ayumi. Supreme Commander, our spies has alerted us that the Empire is assembling their army. We are unsure exactly what they are preparing for, but our location has not been revealed yet. The elves, sensing the message's urgency, quietly excused themselves and left. We need more information. Have them focus on finding the reason for the mobilization of their army. Understood. We might need to prepare for a fight. How much supplies do we have? Our armory needs some extra ammunition and some weapons in for reserve. In terms of food, we might have slightly underestimated the capabilities of our hunting group since our large freezers are completely full, and we have enough MREs for months. Oh really? I think we might be over hunting. We will temporarily suspend all hunting activities, so it's the perfect time for the forest wildlife to regrow. Should we alert the people? Not yet. Once we know more details, we'll let them know. Understood. Please excuse me. I will pass on the orders. 18. Chapter 11. 
Our spies have been trying to gather as much information about the mobilization of the Empire's army. All we know was that the Emperor received a letter. The origin of the letter was unknown. I looked through the many documents that Ayumi gave me, mainly information about the Empire. Emperor Orcloth currently ruled the Empire. He was the second son of the previous Emperor. However, after his older brother, the Crown Prince and his whole family were assassinated, Orcloth took the throne. Since he ascended to the throne, the life of its people became harder. Taxes were raised, the government was corrupted, and the people suspected of being against the Empire or its Emperor were executed without a trial. He once executed one of his ministers for sneezing during one of his speeches. I got up from my seat and headed out whilst accompanied by two units. It was time to increase our base defenses. We currently have two large warehouses full of materials. I modified the walls and the metal gate to be much thicker and more durable. Barbed wires were placed all around the outside of the base. I built another armory where I created extra ammunition and guns to be stored. I plan to make vehicles like APCs, tanks, and even aircraft. However, there wasn't enough personnel, and the aircraft would require a runway. At the moment, we didn't have enough space to put one in, so I would need to start cutting down some trees. The trees' sizes here are all varied, but most of them are enormous. Axes and chainsaws would take a long time to cut one down. After that, I headed over to the shooting range, where I created many different weapons for me to practice with such as the STG-45, my favorites, the Thompson machine gun, and the AK-47. I also learned that I could create older firearms, like muskets, flintlock pistols, and even older style cannons. I had a try with the flintlock pistol but immediately hated it. It currently sits on a wall in the main meeting room after it was taken apart and made unusable except as decoration. I was meant to have an office to myself, but the place was filled with gold when I entered it. The chairs, tables, and even the walls were gold. This was Ayumi's doing since she was in charge of decorating it. She wanted me to look wealthy and powerful, but all it did was blind me as soon as the lights were turned on. Today, I wanted to try out the machine gun, but I saw that several kids were playing when I arrived. They made their hands look like guns and pretended to shoot the targets. Watching the group of kids were two mothers who volunteered to be babysitters. As soon as they noticed me, they apologized for letting the kids play around the range. I told them it was fine as long as the kids didn't damage anything or get in the way when it was being used. I invited them to watch since I couldn't let them handle firearms. There were little kids here. I took out the M1911 pistol with a suppressor attached. If I used loud machine guns, it would scare the kids. After telling them to stay a reasonable distance away, I began to fire. The suppressor dampened the gunshots reasonably but the kids weren't happy. They wanted the loud ones, which was surprising. I took out the several louder guns and began firing until my arms were numb from the vibration. It sounds like a waste of ammo, but they are collected and then melted into larger chunks so that I can turn them into bullets again. It was now lunchtime for everyone except the units, who didn't need any food. Our meals have become grander, with fresh vegetables and more spices. Thanks to the espionage units, we have stored a decent amount of supplies. During this, the units have made connections with several merchant companies, which is another big bonus since we can get information from the merchant who travels anywhere money can be made. All the intelligence that has been gathered is currently being reviewed and processed into a report. Overseeing everything was Ayumi. Sometimes, I did think about my role in this. The units worship me as their creator and don't question anything I do. Ever since coming here, I've been thinking about my future goal. I had the power to build my own army and probably become the king of my own country. Against people who have only just started to use trebuchets, my army would be victorious 90% of the time. However, this does not include magic, which we were still gathering more information on. Despite being knowledgeable about magic, the elves had no idea how the human magic weapons work. What was the reason I chose this power in the first place? I must have had a good reason unless I just wanted to have fun with guns. Usually, Ice Sky protagonists would get overpowered skills to save the world from an evil demon lord. I had overpowered skill, but there were no threats of a demon lord. The only person who might know was the person who sent me here. Supreme Commander, it's an emergency. Please look up. Ayumi calls in through the radio, which snaps me out of my thoughts. I did as she said and looked up. The sky was slowly becoming red, 
The sun looked like it was being swallowed up and replaced by a giant red moon. What the fuck? Supreme Commander, our spies report that every decade or two, for a week, the sky suddenly becomes dark red, and the red moon makes the monsters extremely aggressive. They call it the Blood Moon Apocalypse. 19. Chapter 12. Monsters could be seen surrounding the whole base. This was day one of the Blood Moon Apocalypses. As soon as Ayumi's message came through, all the people were forced to stay in their houses. This was to prevent them from getting in the way of our defensive operations. It would seem that most of the older generation people and the elves had experienced the Blood Moon Apocalypses before. Several people, including the elves, volunteered to help and defend. We told them that there was no need to help with defense for now. The first wave of monsters came at around 3 in the afternoon. Roughly a thousand of them advanced towards our base. From the camera feeds I could see monsters like goblins, kobolds, and even a three-eyed deer. We didn't have any tactics except shooting them if they got too close. The mortars and howitzers dealt immense area damage, and within two hours of non-stop fighting, the monsters all retreated. We managed to kill nearly three-quarters of the number of monsters. Their corpse was laid scattered everywhere. I went around each armory and replenished the ammunition and extra weapons if some broke or jammed up. The logistics units were busy transporting ammunition around and sorting out the food for the people. For now, we gave them frozen meats to cook to get rid of some of our stock, and if we needed more food, we could dig into our reserves of MRE. But since the blood moon was only going to last for a week, there should be no need. I gathered all the civilians and told them that we successfully defended against the first wave but that it wasn't over. I installed sirens throughout the base and said that they needed to return to their houses immediately should this go off. Those who do not listen would be arrested. I then dismissed everyone for them to do their work, as if everything was normal. The hunting group was sent to bring back all usable monsters to be processed or analyzed. For the farming group, there was a big problem. All the growing crops needed sunlight for photosynthesis. Our solution was artificial lights with a specific wavelength that plants can survive under. It has been placed as a top priority in the workshop. After killing so many monsters during the first wave, I had also leveled up. I was now level 6, and my unit limit had increased by 300. At the start of day 2, I began by creating more units, adding 10 more mortars with 30 more units. Typically the mortars require 6 crew members, but we only needed half the amount since the units can do more than the average human. I also expanded the base to nearly double its original size, with new walls, more towers, and a heavier gate. Each new tower had an M2 machine gun mounted on top. I created 200 more units armed with rifles and another 50 with M60 machine guns. Our newest weapon is the TM46 mines. Anti-tank mines made by the Soviets. I ordered 50 of these to be placed outside the base. They are marked on the map so that after this is over, they can be easily located and retrieved. The TM46 mines have a metal casing making them very easy to find with metal detectors which is something that I doubt the monsters would have. The second wave of the monster began around noon. The siren went off, and the people rushed home whilst the units got into positions. There were twice as many monsters as last time, and this time, a new enemy showed a bit of a problem. There was a giant tortoise around 3 meters long, with a large shell that deflected bullets, and the artillery had not much effect. The rest of the monsters were still massively affected by our weapons. The giant tortoise was slow but highly durable. With each step, the ground shook, but then the monster's underbelly exploded. That was the doing of the anti-tank mines we had placed earlier. With the fall of the giant tortoise, the rest of the monsters retreated. This time we managed to kill only half of the monster forces. We retrieved the tortoise using the Chinooks since we estimated it to weigh nearly two tons. The people were then allowed out of their houses, and we repeated the same thing. I went around replenishing even more ammunition, grenades and guns. We also placed 20 more anti-tank mines. My level was now 8, and my unit limit was increased by 200. On day 3, we received several reports from the espionage units from the Empire of how well they were doing against the monsters. The information reported that the Empire had suffered over 30,000 deaths, including soldiers and civilians, lost two major towns and dozens of lost villages. They are currently experiencing immense food shortages. The Empire had enough grain stored, but they weren't given to its people. Instead, the Emperor is selling them at extremely high prices. Not only that, taxes were increased, 
the reasons were for the army. But the army themselves was slowly losing power as well. So I think even kids can figure out where the money is going. At that point, I was shocked at the actions of the emperor. The empire was falling apart. People were dying and starving. Only the emperor's pockets were happy. This was a pretty good opportunity for us to come out. No, not that kind of way. You know what I mean. With the empire and probably other countries losing their power, it's the perfect time for us to emerge as a nation. Even though we probably have the power to take down a middle-aged army with ease, the public would see us as monsters just like another blood moon apocalypse. We needed allies who have good reputations amongst the people, which would increase the public's opinion of us. Many monsters were edible, whereas goblins and trolls apparently tasted just as bad as they looked. I had the spies gather information about territories suffering considerable damages and food shortages but ruled by respectable and honest lords. I plan to give them food aid. In return, they will declare allegiance to me. This was how I was going to reveal our identity. If several lords join me, the power of the empire will decrease significantly. But that's if the monsters or their emperor's greed doesn't destroy it before the plan is put fully into action. I increased the number of mining drills, additional warehouses, and another food factory with 20 worker units. In terms of ingredients, we only had the meat. Our crops had only just started to sprout, so there were no vegetables except a few crates that we had already stockpiled. Moving on, I created 20 Bell UH-1 Iroquois, which is a well-known utility helicopter suitable for many different roles, such as ground attacks or logistics transport. It was also known as the Huey. I also created several M40 recoilless rifles as our newest weapon against the giant turtles. Our artillery was effective as long as they landed a direct hit but they weren't consistent. The M40 recoilless rifles were used as an anti-tank weapon and should deal some damage to the giant turtle. Wave 3 eventually came. This time, there were several giant tortoises. They attacked as tanks whilst the monster army of 3000 hid behind them. I began to see a pattern of the monster army, and I was not too fond of it. The newest type of monster were these large boars with decently tough bodies and very fast legs. For the first time, we suffered casualties. Several units were destroyed by the boars when they rammed into them. Eventually, our outside defense barricade had to be abandoned. As long as our machine guns focused fire on them, these boars would be ripped into shreds. Third wave was successfully repelled. I replenished ammunition and replaced the broken units with a few new ones. My level was now 10, and now I had 1,200 as my unit limit. 16. Chapter 13. There was some urgent news for me. The drills recently found a few unknown materials, but most of them were weak and useless. However, they managed to find a new mysterious material this time, and when I asked the elves about it, they were shocked. It was about 5 meters tall and had a matte black color. Attempts to gather samples failed as it was simply too strong. The elves told me that this was a dragon's fong, one of the first creatures to roam this planet. They were the strongest in this world, apart from the gods. Nothing on this planet could even come close enough to rival the power of a dragon except its own species. My powers could create units out of any material, so I decided to test that theory. I opened my phone and created a unit made of dragon fong. The unit in front of me looked like a standard unit. However, its body was a matte black color. I ordered it to go outside the base, where we began to shoot every weapon we had. I even ordered it to hug an anti-tank mine. The bullets bounced off and the anti-tank mine didn't even leave a scratch on it. If I could, I would try firing missiles at it. The gods have noticed your actions. They are impressed with your ideas. However, to keep the balance of this world, only five units can be made from the dragon fong. Wait, the gods, they can see what I'm doing. I don't think even having one is a good idea. I wonder why five though. Ayumi, who came over to watch our experiment, was reading through various reports. Supreme Commander, the new unit is highly durable. However, the energy consumption is extremely high. Hmm, that's fine. How long can the battery last? At most two days. Ah, that could be why 5 was the limit. For it to be indestructible, the trade-off is that its battery consumption is exceptionally high. I guess this is pretty balanced. I made four more units out of the Dragon Farm. I plan to use them as a special forces unit. So they were currently stationed at the recharge hub only to be activated when needed. I still had about half of the dragon fong, which I left inside the warehouse. I plan to see if I can try to turn these into vehicles, but for now, 
I created extra combat units. It was the fourth day, and I was tired of not feeling the sun's light. The temperature didn't drop when the sun disappeared, but the feeling of sunlight was something to be missed. Our espionage unit was busy working gathering information that I wanted. We had quite a small pool of candidates, and every second it would change. Because of the monster's attacks, many lords had fallen. Our best candidate was a lord, who had only 8,000 people in a small territory. He has less than a thousand poorly equipped soldiers to defend his territory with the small population. The lord himself was an honest one, his family were high-ranking lords, but after Orcloth took the throne, they were demoted. He had nothing grand and always prioritized his family and people first. He even sold his little accumulated wealth to purchase food for his people. Just reading the reports, I already liked him. With our Amari factory producing day and night, our storages were full of food. I gave the order to make contact with this lord. I added 400 more basic combat units to my army and also assembled a Huey squadron to fly around during the fight against the monster army. The Hueys are equipped with M60 machine guns and, when coordinated with troops on the wall, could make defending a lot easier. On day 4, we were greeted by another monster army. Dozens of large blue trolls emerged from the trees armed with huge wooden clubs. We had purchased a book about every known monster and we've stored all our research on our computer database. And from what we know so far about trolls, they have tough skin and regenerative abilities. Usually, to kill one would require a large group of 200 to even have a chance of taking one down. They would either need to freeze it with magic or damage it enough so that it can't regenerate. We opted for the second option by concentrating on explosive firing at the trolls. But it did take a very long time to take one of them down. After our battle, I had all the troll bodies collected using the Chinooks. There was a reason I wanted to collect them all, and that was because troll's blood was one of the ingredients to make healing potions. The healing potions had a shelf life of a year before they turned into a bottle of random chemicals. They had the power to heal small to medium wounds, but they couldn't cure things like colds or infections. The only problem was that we needed an alchemist who knew how to combine the other ingredients. Alchemists were in short supply in the first place which decreased our chance. After processing everything, we had just over a hundred gallons of troll blood. Plus, things like troll bones were extremely sturdy and could be sold to make weapons. We didn't have any use for it, as it wasn't good with the cold. After the apocalypse, there will be a lot of monster material on the market, decreasing its price probably for a year or more. However, I wouldn't be surprised if rarer things like a troll would remain at quite a high price. At the end of day four, my level increased to 13, and my unit limit was increased by 600. 16. Chapter 14. Wave 5 had 5,000 monsters. This time, large bird-like monsters, with one giant claw, dropped rocks onto our base. We were safe as long as we shot them down before they were over the base. Our walls suffered quite a bit of damage from the charging bores, and the metal gate had a dent, but I repaired them and improved them. On day 6, I created 10 Flak 88, operated by 50 units, to protect our skies. They proved to be very effective, though sometimes the large birds dropped their rocks before being shot down. At level 18, I had about 1,800 unused units. Currently, we have enough to defend our one base. However, when we do expand, they would come to good use. Diamond Suit Diamond Suit Diamond Suit It was the seventh day, the final day. The espionage unit managed to make contact with the chosen lord. I spoke through the unit and managed to come to a deal. We would provide supplies and reinforcements as long as he pledged allegiance to me and cut off all ties with the empire. We were in the process of drawing up a contract. I created another 20 Huey helicopters and sent those along with a Chinook carrying tons of supplies and a mixed group of units, mainly combat units. When our convoy of supplies and troops arrived, the food and water were handed out to the people, and the units set up defensive positions. I had the units use human faces so that the people would not be scared of them. I learned that whilst I had to fight against 7,000, the Lord's army so far only had to fight a thousand at most. I might have a clue about the ones pulling the strings behind our absurd number of monsters. But anyways, the Lord thanked us profusely. I should remember his name instead of calling him the Lord. I think it was Howdart or something. Wave 7 was the hardest. Several new monsters emerged, a giant grasshopper that nearly managed to jump over the wall, 
pterodactyl-like monsters would swoop in and grab units with their mouths or claws. And then there was our good friend, the giant minotaur, and his new group of minotaur friends. We learned that the now enormous giant was a higher minotaur species called Minotaur King. They have much higher intelligence and strength to lead their army. Typically a Minotaur King army would be leading an army in the thousands, but it would seem that this one was in the middle of building his army when we intervened during our hostage rescue op. All the Minotaurs were highly aggressive, and it would seem that the power of the Blood Moon also made them taller and more muscular than before. At first, the Minotaurs threw large bits of rocks. Then, trees were pulled off the ground and then thrown at the wall. For the first time, we had a hole in the wall. Thankfully it was nowhere near the houses, and only a couple of units were destroyed. The monsters began to all focus on that gap between our walls, but with our large amount of heavy firing, we obliterated them. The M40 rifles and anti-tank mines were the most effective weapons against the Minotaurs and their durable body. The Minotaur King took down dozens of units before it had its feet blown off by explosives. Then a single round from the M40 RCL went through its eyes and exploded its skull. We managed to survive the whole apocalypse. My level was now 20, and there was something else. I could now make arms made before 1980. 15. Chapter 15. I want to eat rice. I miss it so much that at this point, I would be willing to trade a weapon or two for a small bag. Actually, maybe that's too far. Finding rice was one of the top priorities for the espionage units. But with the food market prices going high and the quantities low, it was very unlikely we would find any at the moment. I remember that I was searching for a purpose in this life, and I think I just found it. I had to focus on other things to keep my crippling rice addiction at bay. Our cleanup went exceptionally well. The hunting group showed us what parts of the monsters were valuable, and we buried the rest in a large pit near this small tree that was still growing. Several tons of supplies were being dropped off at Lord Howdert's, the Lord's name I finally learnt. We had planned to meet and properly discuss our terms. I feel like the meeting will go smoothly. But for now, I had about a hundred units stationed there. You might have wondered why Lord Howdert's people couldn't just eat the edible monsters to prevent starvation? Most of them didn't know which monsters were edible and which ones were poisons. But the main reason was that they all believed that eating the monsters meat during the apocalypse would make you psychotic. But of course it didn't. Our next and final business was, of course, upgrades. With the final rewards, I could summon weapons before 1980. That didn't mean I would replace every single thing we had already. The FAO would remain the standard gun, but I won't be making any more of them. I plan to slowly replace a few with the M16 and 33 Hong Kong dollars. In terms of new types of vehicles, 20 M1 Abrams tanks, 20 of the Bell AH-1 Super Cobra attack helicopters, and 10 M109 howitzer were made. I finally built that underground area, where all our top secret things will be done. There were three reinforced steel doors. In order, there was a facial, voice, and hand recognition device. Of course, the units do not have to use anything. Apparently, my creations can recognize each other. I moved the giant dragon fog down there to complete experiments in secret. I left a useless big of metal, painted matte black, in its place. I have no idea why, but I had a feeling that it might be helpful in the future. Now, all we had to do was wait. Wait for the Empire to realize that they had been betrayed and an enemy was growing in their backyard. Their army has been exhausted it would be difficult for them to attack us. In terms of their technology, it was around the Middle Ages. But one thing that bothered me was that magic was also at play, something we do not know much about. Next on my agenda was an announcement to the people. I told them that the monsters were successfully repelled in our alliance with a nearby lord. I mentioned that the Empire might attack us, but it would seem that people had faith in our weapons and defensive capabilities, as none of them looked worried. I also had a private talk with the elves about magic. They said things like magic weapons and armor exist. However, most of them were low-grade ones. There are only limited amounts of high-grade magic tools, but they were considered artifacts. Anyways, they chose to stay. The elves wanted to repay me for saving their lives, and apparently, the metal bows that we made them were a big hit. But that was expected for these incredible archers to be in love with these bows. I remember seeing one of the elves calling his bow name whilst he cleaned it. And that was all I needed to do, at the base. Our new potential ally, which I'm confident will join us, is still having its struggles. 
Haldrit's private army had to be disbanded since he could not afford to pay their wages and replace or repair damaged equipment. The money they used was gold, silver, and then copper, the classic ice sky currency. A hundred coppers were one silver whilst a hundred silvers were one gold coin. The average price for a loaf of bread was only 15 coppers. Inflation has increased to a silver coin. I plan to set up some drills in his territory and give him a share of the profits. Things like gold weren't really that valuable to me except for electronics and stuff like that. And I really want to remove some of the gold so that Ayumi can't use them. Want to know why? After the golden office surprise, Ayumi secretly ordered the workshop to produce golden 1 colon 1 statues and mini figures of me. Thankfully I found out before mass production began. There was 1 1 colon 1 and 4 mini statues of me, which we planned to turn back into gold ingots. But of course, this world uses them as a currency, and I had tons of gold mined from the several mining drills making me extremely wealthy in their eyes. To help Hodart, I planned to give him a lot of gold and say it was a welcoming gift. With his reputation, he should have many other trustworthy friends who will seek to join us after hearing about the gold and help he has received. The Empire would lose even power even if they were minor lords. But I couldn't just stop there. If my plan succeeds, which I'm 100% sure would, many other countries around us will gladly attack us to take over the Empire's land. But for now, I will focus on fighting the Empire and finding rice. 13. Chapter 15.5 This happened on day 7 of the Blood Moon Apocalypse in Roland Haudert's territory. Lord Roland Hodart was only 32 years old, but he looked like he was 40 due to the recent catastrophe. Not only that, nearly over 4,000 people were dying and starving all around his tiny territory of only two towns and three villages. Everyone was cooped behind the town walls, which looked like it would collapse if pushed with little effort. What do you mean, the tax has increased? He yelled at the man, who introduced himself as a tax collector. Mind your voice. If you raise your voice against me, you're raising your voice against our emperor. The tax collector says with a slimy grin. I trust that the money will be ready when I'm back, in three days. I will now take my leave. After the tax collector left, Roland slumped back onto his chair. With tax nearly doubled, his people were dying and starving. There was no way that this territory was going to survive. Even with only one last day left of the blood moon apocalypses, they would not even last another hour. It would seem like you require some assistance. A female voice called out behind him, which surprised him. W what who are you? Fear not. My name is E5. I am here to present you an offer. What do you want? If you can't see, the people are dying and starving out there. I have nothing to give. We only want you to swear allegiance to us. And who are you working for, the Union? No, we are an organization that has no name. We hide in the shadows. But our leader decided that it was the time for us to reveal ourselves to the world. And what does it have to do with me? We need someone reputable joining our organization, kind of like a representative. We have deemed you to be worthy. What are the terms? We will provide food, water and will send some of our operatives to help you defend against the wave of monsters. And all you ask is that I leave the empire and join your organization? Yes, as long as you stay loyal, we will keep giving you our support. Why should I join you? I have no idea who you people are, and if the empire learns that I change sides, there will be war. If you do not accept, you people will starve and die. This is the only chance you have. Those words resonated in Roland's mind. Unless the gods intervened, there was no other way they would survive. Fine, I want a written contract. Where are the supplies and troops coming from? A forest that you call the Abyssal Forest. The Abyssal Forest. It's going to take a week to get here. We won't even be alive by then. Please do not mind about our transport methods. Please place trust in us that supplies will arrive. For now, please sign this temporary contract. One with finer details will be made. Roland hesitantly signs the contract. Very well, the contract is now signed. We will begin our support. Strange sounds began to come from outside of the courtyard. Roland rushes to the window and peeks outside. Outside was five of the Huey helicopters and a Chinook. Large boxes of supplies were dropped, and units with human faces began to flood into the courtyard. Of course, to Roland and the other people, this looked alien to them. W what are these things? 19. Chapter 16. Today was the day when I would be having a meeting with Lord Hodart to sort out the conditions of our alliance. Ayumi was the one in charge of preparing everything on my end. 
she presented me with several clothes for our meeting. One was a suit made of gold, which she forced me to try on, but the thing was so heavy I couldn't even get up. I went with a simple black suit made from materials we had previously bought from the Empire. Our ride was a Huey helicopter and two Super Cobras to protect us whilst in the air. I was fully prepared to see a fully gold-plated Huey, but surprisingly it was painted white and blue. Ayumi was to stay and manage the base whilst I was gone. I deliberately stored all the gold in the item box but left only enough in emergency cases. Protecting me were several combat units, all transformed to look human, and as backup, the DFSF, Dragon Fang Special Forces, was on standby should anything happen. Just before we took off, I saw plates of gold were tucked away behind some boxes. I shivered when I wondered what they were going to be used for. Our journey would take a bit longer since we needed to avoid towns and villages. But if some travelers managed to see a flying metal box, there was no way to prevent that. I doubt many people would believe them anyway. We landed in the courtyard of Howdit's house, which was just a small manor house. I could see him, along with who I can assume is his wife and daughter, waiting for me. I approached him, and they all bowed down to me. I, Roland Hodart, am honored to have you here at my humble home. Not just me, but all my people are thankful for the support that you have given to us. Raise your heads. It will be hard to talk like that, I said, my voice and tone suddenly changing to a more authoritative type for some reason. Thank you. Please follow me to my house. But please excuse us for the lack of snacks and tea, as we are still recovering from the apocalypse. There are no worries there. In fact, I bought some tea leaves gathered from the forest. I had a box of my favorite type of tea leaves from this world to his wife, along with several other types. There were four large containers of tea leaves, so I had a unit carry them for her. Thank you very much for your generosity, says Roland as he gives me a quick bow again. I followed him to a room inside his house, where there were only two sofas. I sat on one side, and he sat on the other. Again I must thank you for bringing supplies to us in our time of need. Of course, as long as you become our ally, our support will never end, I said as I showed him a contract. There were quite a few things on there, but all it says is show your allegiance to us, and we will provide any support as long as we can do it. Also permission to set up a military outpost and mining drills in his land. Most of these terms would look like it favors Roland's side, but in the long term, we would both profit. His people would be safe, and I get to chip away at the Empire's power. Someone needed to stop that Emperor, who only knew how to exploit his own people. Roland was too deep into reading the contract he didn't even realize that his wife had returned with tea. Eventually, he finishes. You say that you will provide us with food and protection until we get back on our feet. And even after that, you say that only 15% tax yearly? Why, is 15% still too much? Maybe I should lower it to 10, I said. I didn't need money in this world for now, but it would help to have some to buy things with. Most of the time we have been buying bulk amounts of goods, using chunks of gold. That's why only 15% tax. No, 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 we will do 15% tax. He quickly says while signing the piece of paper and handing it back. I took a look and signed it as well. Welcome. Now I have bought an obese man wearing golden laced clothes bursts through the door and cuts off my words. The interruption slightly pisses me off. Hodart, I'm here for the tax. Like I said last time, it's two gold per person now. No, this time there is no tax. My agreement with the Empire was broken, the Emperor promised to send reinforcement during the apocalypse, but the only thing that arrived was you. That's not my problem. I am only here to collect mandatory tax on the Emperor's behalf. Well, tell him that our agreement has been annulled. Now leave. You have disturbed an important meeting. How dare you talk back to the representative of the Emperor like that. If you continue to show disrespect, I will report this as an act of rebellion, he shouts, while spit goes everywhere. I ignored him and continued with what I was saying whilst he was screaming and stomping his feet. I made sure that my voice was loud and clear for him to hear. Lord Roland Hodart, you have declared that you are now leaving the Empire and joining us. As a welcome gift, please accept this. A eunuch carried a large briefcase and placed it on the table. Roland opens it whilst the fat tax collector goes silent. The inside of the briefcase was filled with gold bars. Roland's jaw dropped to the ground, and so did the tax collectors. I hope you have enough room cause I got like nine more of them for you. I announced as units bought more cases into the room. 
ten boxes. All this gold. Are you serious? Yes, a special gift for the first member of our little alliance. Of course, there will still be gold for anyone who joins after. But it won't be as much, though. Roland shakenly nodded at my words. What the hell do you think you're doing, Hodart? If you show a sign of rebellion, the Empire won't hesitate to destroy you. Kill that brat and hand over all that gold, and I will put in a good word for you. Ha ha ha, I laughed. Hodart, there's no need to be afraid of the Empire anymore. As per our agreement, we will provide supplies and troops. You have seen some of our weapons in action, but do let me tell you, those are not even our best weapons. And who do you think you are, brat, think you can handle the Empire's might? Once I return to the capital, I will make sure that everyone here is massacred. Oh, and why do you think you can make it out of here? Roland says, for the first time, he had the power. All my units on cue, begin to approach the tax collector. Wait, stop. I've got the seal of the Emperor. You cannot harm a representative, he yells. And do you think you can handle the might of my army? I said coldly as the units restrained him, then took a sip of tea. The tea that his wife made is so much better than usual. I might come here regularly just for tea, but I think Ayumi, who makes my tea, might get mad. 17. Chapter 17. After our meeting, I rode on the Huey to a specific location within Roland's territory. Roland stayed behind so that plans to rebuild his towns could proceed with the cases of gold that I gave him. Oh, the tax collector? He's currently locked up in a jail cell. Anyways, back on track. We are going to a massive open field. It was one of the prime locations for an airfield to be built. I built warehouses, several hangars, mining drills, unit recharge hubs and two really long runways. Around the base, barbed wire fences and watchtowers are set up. Our new aircraft included 5 AC-130 gunship, 5 C-130 Hercules, 5 B-52 Stratofortress, 10 A-10 Thunderbolt II, also known as the Warthog, 5 F-16 Fighting Falcon. I'm convinced we can dominate the sky during wars and cause destruction on the ground with ease. I created a thousand combat units, split between protecting the airbase and Roland's territory. Another group of 200 units to operate all aircraft and keep the place functioning. I then returned to Roland's house to have dinner with them. I gave them meat from the Minotaur King that was left untouched from our attacks. Roland's wife personally cooked our meal, and it was delicious. After our dinner, Roland wanted to have a talk. The lord of the neighboring territory was one of his closest friends. Their land was also suffering just like his own was. I told him that we would consider helping them. Back at the base, I read through reports after reports for the rest of the night. In the end, the Empire had suffered over 40,000 deaths and lost several towns and villages. Their exhausted army was mobilized immediately to take care of lords that had begun to rebel against the Empire. Unlike the Empire, other countries like the Western Union, which comprises several smaller states, were already getting back onto their feet. For now, we send our spies there to import some goods from there. We continue to observe the war between the Empire and the rebel army for a week. Despite the Empire being more equipped, they were still having a hard time. Even using my toe, I can think of the main reason. The Empire's army was commanded mainly by generals who were simply a bunch of rich people who bought their positions. During the week, we sent supplies to Roland's friend after we checked that he, too, was a virtuous person. The only thing separating our forest and our other allies was land that belonged to the Empire. I built another base that had a smaller runway and a thousand units to go with it in our newest territory. We also began to expand the main base by using these new tree cutting machines that can be attached or detached from the Humvees. This allowed me to expand our walls and increase the amount of structure we had, such as more warehouses, mining drills, farms, and we even built a bathhouse. The bathhouse was favorite amongst the people, me included. I also introduced games like chess and competitions were held daily. The prizes included things like liquor, beauty products, and luxury goods. Our current champion in Shogi was a nine-year-old girl called Lena. She had won every game so far. Yes, even I was amazed by her skill, but when against the units that were supercomputers, no one stood a chance. I even did a little experiment by having two units compete with each other, with no options for a draw. The game has been going on for three days now, and people have started to bet on them with rewards they've earned themselves. It's totally an excellent use of units, and gives entertainment to the people. Productivity has increased from people wanting to finish their work, 
and start playing or watching as soon as possible. I also showed Roland and his friend Aiden, who was immediately hooked on chess. During one of our chess sessions, they mentioned that they both received calls from the Empire to suppress the rebels, whilst the rebels asked them to join them. Of course, none of them accepted, and I greatly appreciated their actions. But it was an excellent opportunity to show ourselves and take the land to connect our territories. I told them to message the rebels and tell them that if we help them win, we get the land that separates us. Of course, they did not mention the type of reinforcements, anything about me and our little alliance. The rebels accepted those terms, so we started to prepare. I chose to help the rebel side because it was a more straightforward way to take down that greedy emperor. We were told to send our reinforcement to a city that was going to be attacked by the empire. Apparently, it was 3,000 defending against 15,000. Usually, it would take a week for an army to arrive, and the city would have fallen by then. But we didn't have to march soldiers. Instead, we had helicopters, attack planes, and bombers. We sent out a Huey with units to contact and get the details from whoever was in charge. The Warthogs and AC-130 gunship were on standby. 18. Chapter 18. Standing on the walls of the Rollies, a large town with thousands of people, was Arisu. She was only 21 but had already earned herself the title as a fierce warrior, skilled with the sword and the bow. Even then, she would not last against the 15,000 enemies, who had just set up camp outside. With only 3,000 poorly equipped troops and a stone wall, it was a matter of time before they fell. God damn it, where are our reinforcements? She curses. Her adjutant, Lana, who was one of her old classmates from school, replies. Unfortunately, they can't spare us any. Our orders are only to hold on until reinforcements from Lord Hodart and Bartram arrive. Even then, I doubt we can win. Then what are our options? We should evacuate the whole city, and our walls won't hold on long, so we might need to resort to urban warfare. Fine, pass on those orders now. We should have some time before they can attack. The soldiers from the Empire had spent hours marching to the city. They were resting and setting up their siege weapons like the trebuchet. A Huey hovers over the base during the night. The soldiers on night watch spotted them, and the soldiers are in disarray. With no clue what it was, a rope drops down, and a unit slides down with its face camouflaged. The rebel soldiers immediately form a wall around the unit. I would like to speak to the leader, it says. Arissa sensed no hostility from it but did not know that it was not alive. She tells all the soldiers to hold. I am the leader here. Who sent you? We are reinforcements sent on behalf of Lord Hodart and Lord Bartram. I've never seen such weapons and that flying object. I never knew they had hidden some magic armaments. Where did they get them? The unit does not reply. Arissa takes the silence as its reply. Fine. When are the reinforcements coming? They are stationed somewhere and will arrive during the fight. That's too late. Lana shouts. We need as many as we can to defend the walls. Those are my orders. Our weapons are not able to be stationed on the walls. What? Lana, stop. Arissa interrupts. Can you guarantee that we will receive those reinforcements during the fight? Yes, a couple of us will be stationed here as your contact. Fine. On their agreement, five more units slide down. Their equipment was strange, and the rebel soldiers were wary of them. The next day the Empire soldiers were all lined up. A horseback messenger approaches with a letter to the rebels. Its content was unexpected. Usually, the side with the upper hand would tell the enemy to surrender, to stop unnecessary bloodshed. But all this message said was that even if they surrendered, they would all be executed. There was a specific note for Arissa that she would become a toy for their army. Instead of scaring the rebels, it infuriated them even more. The message was also shown to the units, who relayed it to the central command. Of course, their offer was rejected, and the fight began. Archers shot arrows back and forth. Catapults and trebuchets launched large projectiles, hitting the walls. Arisu herself was on the wall firing her bow non-stop. Every shot hit its target, but she couldn't shoot enough. She eventually ran out of arrows and pulled out her sword. She slashes an enemy climbing the ladder up the wall, and then charges into a large group of enemies. Arms, legs, and heads flew every time she moved, but she wasn't invincible. An arrow hits her in the leg, and her movement stops. Immediately. The enemy surrounds her. She was too far away from her allies, and she could see Lana trying to fight her way over. Lay down your weapon, and we won't treat you too roughly. They taunted. Yeah, and take off. Their words were cut off as they were all put down by the units. The guns were loud, 
which surprised not only the enemies but the rebel allies as well. What the hell are those weapons? Arissa wonders, and a nearby unit answers. This is called a gun. I would suggest seeing a medic now. Reinforcement has arrived. Arissa looks over the wall but doesn't see any reinforcement soldiers. Where? I don't see any? Suddenly AC-130s and warthogs fly overhead. The battlefield suddenly goes quiet as everyone stops fighting to look up. First, siege weapons were destroyed by the cannons from the AC-130 and bombs dropped by the warthogs. Then they began to lay hell on the Empire soldiers, who were torn to shreds by the Gatling guns and explosions. Dragons? We've woken up the dragons. Everyone run! Shouts a panicked soldier. No one knows which side it was from, but they all ran for their lives. They didn't know that only the Empire's soldiers were being targeted. All they knew was that they needed to run. At the Empire's main camp, a young woman tried to put armor onto a fat obese man. The obese man was the one leading the attack. Of course, he bought his position with money, so he had not actually achieved anything or experienced commanding an army. Commander dragons, there are dragons everywhere. A panicked man runs into the tent, which surprises everyone, and every bit of armor pops off like a button on a tight shirt. Shut up, it's just a dragon. I can kill one in my sleep. I will head out personally and let you witness my powers. As soon as every bit of armor was put on with a large rope strapped around his chest plate to keep it in place, he headed out on a chariot with six large war horses attached. Even then, the horses struggled to pull the heavy load. On the battlefield, soldiers were running in random directions. The Empire soldiers who were in the open were easy targets. Dragons, bow down to my power. He yells as he brandishes his golden sword and points it towards the sky. But of course, they weren't dragons. And even if they were real dragons, the obese man would look more like a greasy fat ball. At the same time, the A-10s and AC-130s began to leave the sky to replenish ammunition. The remaining Empire soldiers began to cheer for their commander, thinking he had actually scared away the dragons and reorganized themselves to fight again. Ha ha see, those dragons are scared of me. Look at them flying Awa. Loud whistling sounds interrupted. Those were the bombs dropped by the B-52 bombers, which can carry up to 70,000 pounds of explosives. They were brought in to finish everything off. A large shell lands in the middle of the soldier and explodes. The slaughtering was not over, and the remaining soldiers were decimated. All the rebels had their jaws dropped as they watched the massacre from the walls. Their panic had stopped after Arissa told them that they were the reinforcements the best reinforcements they could ever get. 16. Chapter 19. We found rice. When I described rice to Roland, he immediately knew what I was talking about. In this world, they did not eat rice. Instead, they used them to feed farm animals. It was hard to find because they did not appear in the marketplaces where the units were searching, as they were extremely cheap and no one ate them. I immediately contacted farmers and bought all their extra stock with gold. If only they knew how to cook rice, they could have avoided the food crisis. I had rice cookers produce. These were portable, unlike the usual rice cooker. The batteries were made during the development of a replaceable unit battery. It could only last the unit for one week, so it was rejected. But of course, using it in a rice cooker could probably last for more than a month. I showed Roland, who was curious about my obsession with rice. His whole family were immediately addicted to the sweet and fluffy rice. And they begged me to give them a rice cooker. I think they were happier than when I gave them the gold. But I guess that's the power of rice. We also found crude oil. Like rice, they had no idea how to use it. They didn't know that it goes boom when near a fire. I was surprised to find crude oil this close to the earth's surface. But this was a different world. Several mines were shut down because they dug into a crude oil reserve. But that just meant good news for us. I went around and built refineries at each point. Most of them were at Aiden's territory, so we paid them a bit of gold as a fee. Also, they got addicted to rice as well. And oh, we also destroyed the Empire's army. I guess that's more important. They did make some nasty threats, including making a girl a slave, which kind of pissed me off, so we returned their aggression with aggression. The units we sent beforehand had scouted the enemy's strength and equipment. Then we waited to see the types of tactics they used. I was disappointed when all they did was launch projectiles and climb the walls. So we intervened, as there was nothing really special like those magic cannons being used, which was what I wanted to see. A sample would also be nice. We also captured a few prisoners, 
and they were taken back to the main base, blindfolded. Apparently, we had another Jilet. Jilet is our newest code word for people whose ego is extremely inflated. Our newest Jilet demanded the unit's obedience, so I ordered them to tape his mouth so that not even the units had to suffer. He was bragging that he was the one who scared the dragons away, which just confused me because I did not receive any words of a dragon appearing. Interrogation with the new Jilet did not go very far, but the other prisoners were more than happy to betray their country for better treatment. The information we gathered wasn't that significant. Their treatment was nothing special, just food three times a day, a comfy bed, and chess. They began to bet against each other with their deserts, which were gold to them. It reminded me to build a larger prison. I also want a rehabilitation program to be put in place for offenders to change their ways and an opportunity to rejoin society. But that's for later, an empire needed to be destroyed first. Our spies confirmed that they sent reports of our reinforcements to the leaders of the rebel army, who thought it was absurd. However, Arisu, who led the soldiers defending the city, was concerned and sent her spies into Roland and Aiden's territory. Even then, they would not find anything as the airfield was quite far away from any villages and towns. The people only know about the flying helicopters and our units, still using their fake faces. To confuse the spies, we deliberately planted fake letters and reports. All the phony information produced contradicted each other, which would delay their investigation. We even started to have units protect random things with tracking and listening device attached, which we deliberately let them take. The reports that they sent to the Arisu were all over the place. It was only a matter of time before they realized they were being played. During our charade, they requested us to help out in an open field war. It was 40,000 Empire soldiers against 30,000 rebels, but spies in both armies reported that it was to lure us out, to get a good look at our planes. I didn't want to give what they wanted, but at the same time, it could be a way to demonstrate our power, and we did promise the rebels that we would help them, so we had to. We also got intel that magical weapons were in play this time. On the Empire side, there were 10 magic cannons, and they also had a heavy cavalry squad equipped with magical armor. It is an opportunity to test our power against them and get samples. We had Roland and Aiden negotiate with the rebels for several magic weapons on our behalf. They were initially reluctant, asking why they should pay us even more. But we came to a simple deal. We get to keep the ones we destroy. They still underestimated us, despite the numerous reports sent by Arisu, who has been put on the backbench, since they thought she was going crazy. The higher-ups of the rebels will probably regret their decision not to listen to her. 13. Chapter 20. Leading the rebel army was General Iblin. He was a middle-aged man who had seen his fair share of battles. He was known for his skills in commanding an army during the time of the previous emperor. However, with the assassination and the second son rising to the throne, he decided to leave and retire. But after the Blood Moon Apocalypse, he was recruited to help lead the rebel army, who were unhappy with the current emperor's decisions. In the main camp of the rebel army, the commanders were gathered to discuss strategies to use against the Empire. They also talked about the reports that Arissa had sent them several times. She was warning them of the dragons. Most of them were laughing at the report. However, Ibelin had a bad feeling about this. Pfft, dragons, can you believe it? That Arissa has finally gone crazy. I know, right? She says that they were reinforcements from Hodart and Bartram. Whoa, Hodart and Bartram. I'm surprised they managed to survive the apocalypse. Yeah, and the rumors of how they survived were just as absurd as this report. Apparently, Hodart and Bartram tried to negotiate for several of the Empire's magic weapons after we win. No way. Why would they do that when they have dragons? Haha <laughs> dude. Stop look. The final deal was they get to keep the loot they got themselves. I doubt they get anything though. We're going to be the ones that take down the Empire's army. The men chuckled throughout the night until it was the day of the battle. The 30,000 soldiers lined up in order, but there was a problem. The intel suggesting 40,000 troops was wrong. In front of them were 60,000 Empire soldiers, double their numbers. Unrest ran through the rebel soldiers. A horn sounded at the beginning of the battle, and each army began to clash. Diamond suit, diamond suit, diamond suit. We sent the gunships, bombers, and attack aircraft to reinforce the rebels. We scouted the position of the magic cannons and had units ready to attack them during the battle. We could, of course, blow them up with the bombs or the cannons from the AC-130, but a working sample would be more helpful than a magic cannon puzzle piece. 
Ayumi was the one who came up with the plans and the one commanding. First, the warthogs were sent to out anything that could potentially hit our aircraft. However, there were no trebuchets or catapults as this was an open battle. Arrows from bows, or the bolts from crossbows, could barely hit the planes, but that was if the aircraft were flying low altitude. Then gunships and bombers began to unleash hell on the Empire's army, creating chaos in their formation. The bombs exploded, blowing soldiers to pieces. I didn't feel anything emotion since they were the enemy, but I did feel like I should avoid any unnecessary bloodshed from now on. People were screaming, running in random directions, some even dropped onto the ground, pretending to be dead. The horses were going on a rampage, stomping on anyone that got in their way. It was absolute carnage. During this tiny surprise, units snuck behind the magic cannons that were firing large balls of what I can assume is magic. The mages were taking turns channeling magic into the cannon, and after all ten of them had a turn, it launched a bright colored ball. Its firing rate was not high, but it would seem like the damage it can do is pretty significant, as it blasted thirty or so rebels into pieces. Its range was nothing special, about 4,000 to 5,000 meters. A few of the cannons were being recalibrated, aiming up, which we can assume is to try and hit our planes in the sky. So we had the units move in. The unit's objective was to take out the mages and soldiers around the cannon but take a few mages as prisoners. It is so we can get more information about these cannons. Then the Chinooks were deployed to pick up our spoils, a well-executed and straightforward mission. The person leading the rebels was not incompetent as I thought as they seized the opportunity to strike the Empire's army, which was dwindling in numbers with every explosion. I had all the aircraft retreat for now since we might hit some of our allies if they continued. In the end, the Empire surrendered, and we did not see their heavy magic cavalry in action since they weren't deployed in the first place. Our intel suggests that they were pulled back last minute, which was suspicious. We managed to take back four magic cannons and we had units look after the other six until the Chinooks came back to pick them up. We wanted to use the C-130 Hercules, but there was not enough space to land or take off. Considering this, I made eight more Chinooks and five more B-52 bombers and AC-130s. They have proven to be efficient, if not slightly overpowered. In our battle so far, we had air superiority, and the enemy commanders did not have any knowledge of actually commanding an army. They did not have a direct counter against our aircraft, but it didn't mean we should focus on air to ground weapons. There are going to be some cases where they cannot be deployed. Our spies have confirmed that both sides are incredibly wary of us. In the territory controlled by the empire, the people were still suffering. They focused all the resources on the war, and all the lords were hoarding their riches. Whenever the rebels captured one of those lords, all their riches were stripped and given to the people. It is safe to say that the support of the people is with the rebels. On our side, Roland's territory was improving dramatically. After consulting with Ayumi and Roland's new private army commander, I built a wall for them around the towns. Soon they would not require any of our food support. Aiden's territory, which was just as big as Roland's, was in a more dire situation. But now, it was recovering just as fast as Roland's. The refineries and drills built in his territory made him decent profits which were then all put back into improving his territory. Back at our base, we built a school where the kids attended and were taught by more educated people. We had books imported from the Western Union, which were reprinted using modern paper so that every child could get a copy. Plans for building free schools in our other territories are in development. The adults had their jobs to do, and then in the evening, when everyone was off work or school, games and competitions began. Every day felt distinctive but I feared that the people might eventually want to go out to the outside world again. We told them that if they ever wanted to, they could leave. Plans to build tracks for trains were in development as well. It is to make transport of people and supplies more effortless. I planned for there to be a public track and a military track. The units were surveying the land and also calculating the most efficient range. That was all the information written in this extremely long report given to me by Yumi. Supreme Commander we have just received a message from Lord Hodart and Lord Bartram, reported Ayumi. What is it? The message states that the rebel army leaders want to hold a meeting, presumably about the aircraft. They ask, how do you want them to reply? Hmm, tell them to accept. I want the units to be the escorts. Please give them a hidden earpiece and mic, so we can easily hear what they say and keep in contact with them. Understood. 
We have units currently looking into their motive. I will report back as soon as we find anything. Good job. We can prevent any surprises if we know what they have planned. One more thing. The team currently experimenting with the Dragon Fawn has made their first discovery. What did they find? They were able to shave off small amounts of dust, which they then mixed with copper. The result was a metal that was on par with steel. That's great. How much are we able to produce? Currently, it requires about three days of continuous shaving to produce five milligrams of dust, which was the amount used in the test. So it's not very practical, I guess. Have the team produce at least five grams of that stuff whilst conducting other experiments. Understood. I will pass on the orders and get the preparation done for the meeting. 13. Chapter 20.5 I took a stroll around the main base during the evening when the shogi boards were put out and the competition started. Elrin recently defeated our nine-year-old shogi genius. The match was extremely intense but entertaining. The prizes were still mostly items, but once a week, I would make the award a small bar of gold. It is so they can start earning some wealth. Anyways, while I was on my walk, I saw someone was using the shooting range with a bow and arrow. It was the Death Stare Elf girl from before, but recently she had stopped doing it, which makes me happy. Her name was Alora. Hey, what's up? Eek. My unexpected greeting must have scared her as Alora suddenly jumped, dropping her bow and her quiver of arrows. Oops, sorry about that. And no, don't worry about it. She suddenly blurts. Well, what's going on, training your shooting skills? Um, yeah, I guess, she says, barely audible. I noticed that something was bothering her. You seem troubled. What's wrong? It's fine, but if you ever want someone to talk to, I'm always available, I said. But before I could turn around, she grabbed my wrist. Wait, fine, I'll tell you. Surprisingly, she finally opened up to me and told me her story. Before being kidnapped by the Minotaurs, she lived with her older sister. Her older sister had looked after her for as long as she could remember. However, when the Minotaur attacked, both of them were taken by the Minotaur. Apparently, just before the day we came and saved them, her older sister was taken as a sacrifice to the giant Minotaur. She felt angry because if we had noticed and saved them the day before, her sister would have still lived. But over time, she began to realize that it was not our fault that she died but that it was her who was too weak to protect her sister. Now that the giant minotaur had been killed, and the dead had been avenged, her feeling had changed. Now she wants to get stronger, so she doesn't lose anyone. I admired her resolve to get stronger and protect those close to her. But I couldn't share the same feeling. I didn't really have anyone that I could really call family in this world. The closest thing to family was the units, and I like to think our allies were my friends, like Roland and Aiden. Whenever we were free, I would hang out with them, play shogi, or try new food that Roland's talented wife made. She was highly gifted as a chef. Despite being the wife of a lord, she still cooked. I felt really envious of Roland, who gets to eat incredible food every day. Watching them interact lovingly with each other made me want to start my own family. But maybe in the future, there was still a war going on. Anyways back on track. I continued to watch Elora shoot her bow. Her accuracy was outstanding, but the arrows lacked power behind them, as most of them bounced off the target. I thought of a solution to help her. Try these, I said as I bought out a whole range of sniper rifles. From what I have seen, the elves can be trusted. All they want is to protect each other and survive. I also wanted to see how good these archers can do using a sniper. Elora looks at me with confusion. Wait, of course, she has no idea how these work and neither do I. So I called a sniper unit over. Supreme Commander, I am Sniper Unit 5. Thanks for coming over. I would like you to teach, Elora here, how to use a sniper rifle. I have put out different types of rifles here but have her shoot a few to see which one she likes. Understood. I gave the order to the sniper unit and turned back to Elora. I can see that you have great accuracy, but it lacks power. I pointed out the problem, and Elora goes slightly red, these guns require little power to use, but they are extremely accurate. Try them out and see which one you like. This unit is here to teach you. Why are you doing this? I don't know. I just want to help, I guess. Thank you? Yeah, no problem. It kind of got a bit awkward, so I quickly left. Later I learned that Elora had chosen the Remington 700 sniper rifle, and from the unit's report, her skills with the sniper would improve with time. Maybe I should create an elite squad of elven snipers? 12. Chapter 21 
Our recent capture of the Empire's magic cannons got me thinking about something. If we can take their weapons and analyze them, it is possible that it can happen to us. These paranoid thoughts kept me thinking nonstop. What if another country learned how to make guns? Ayumi, who was beside me, had somehow noticed the disturbed expression on my face. Supreme Commander, is there something wrong? She asked. It was scary how advanced the units were, and how well they could read human emotions. Nothing. I was just deep in thought. Have they arrived yet? Yes. Our envoy has arrived at the rebels' main fortress. Good. Put up all the body cams on the screens. Understood. Right now, we were in the central control room, observing the meeting between the rebel army leaders and Roland, who we sent as our sort of ambassador. He arrived in horse-pulled carriages modified with suspensions to make the ride more comfortable and protected by disguised units, who hid their guns but had swords equipped. Our special forces team was on standby should a rescue mission be required, but no information from the espionage units stated that the rebels had such plans. To be honest, I had no real idea of how I wanted this meeting to go. I'm still a teenager who, to be frank, really has no goals except to live an easy life. I had consulted with Ayumi about this, and her suggestion was world domination and a throne made of gold for me to sit on. I made her give me a real piece of advice. Her final suggestion was to announce ourselves as a newly independent nation, which I would rule. At first, I wanted to shoot down the decision because of my lack of management skills, but I remembered that I could summon units with those skills to assist me. Inside the fortress, the meeting room, was three men and one woman. All the men were wearing armor. Unlike the lords with the empire, who wore gaudy armor just to show that they had wealth, these were people who had earned their titles and respect. Welcome, Roland. Thank you for agreeing to meet with us. Greeted Otis, who was the one who started this rebellion. It is nice to see you all doing well, Roland replies. You too. I heard that you and Aiden's territory have suffered quite a lot during the apocalypse, says Christina, the only woman in this group. From our information, she had excellent skills in doing business, despite being only 20 years old. Oh yes, indeed we did, however, we have recovered from that now. Uh, enough with the chit-chat, let's just get on with this, shouts Navar, who stood over two meters tall, on his back was a mega-sized great sword. He's known to be a ruthless warrior and has quite a temper, apparently. Relax, we'll get to it soon, says Tristan, the oldest out of this whole group. Roland tell your men to leave. I want to have a private chat, requests Otis. Ah, uh, that will be a problem. These are not my men, Roland responds. What do you mean? These are people sent by my benefactor to ensure that I am protected, but I have no authority to command them. Hmm, and which country is that? I have never seen any nation use those flying weapons before. Technically, they are not a nation yet. As soon as this war is over, they will announce themselves as an independent country. Mine and Aiden's territory will belong to them as well. Those flying things are called planes apparently. I do not know how they work. Why not ask them to join us? If we combine our forces, we can surely dominate this whole continent. Navar shouts. No, even though we have helped you, it now stops. The amount of reinforcements we have provided is not worth that tiny piece of land that you are giving us as payment. That's unless you are increasing the payment. We're not increasing the payment. All of our funds are being used to support the army, Otis replies in a slightly harsh tone. Hmm, okay. Then we shall no longer assist you anymore. Roland, how much would it cost for one of those bombers? This time, Christina speaks up. I felt something weird with her words but didn't realize what. I'm unsure what you are talking about specifically, but I would be happy to pass on your request. Very well, hey you take this, says Christina, as she passes a sealed letter to one of the units. Give this directly to your leader. Speaking of their leader, who are they? Asked Tristan. Someone beyond any of our imagination, was the reply. I didn't even tell Roland to say that, but I guess I should thank him for that compliment. Well, that's not very helpful. Would it be possible for us to have a face-to-face -face meeting? Inquired Otis. I told Roland what to say this time. No, only after the new nation is created, then they will reveal themselves. This way... They will still have no idea about my identity. The only people who know are Roland, Aiden, and their families, who are being protected and watched over by units constantly. But even with a name, they will not be able to find me. I wanted it to go this way, to play a mind game. People are afraid of things that are unknown to them. 
It would make them think deeply about each move they make in the future or even do the opposite. Now I have to return to my territory. I have some urgent things that need to be taken care of, Roland says as he leaves and climbs onto the carriage. Through the radio, I told Roland that he did a good job and that we should have a drink to celebrate. But first I wanted to see the note. I couldn't quite pinpoint what was wrong with Christina's behavior. Unit 39, show me the contents of the letter. Following my command, the unit placed the note in front of its camera. I would like to meet privately. We have a lot to discuss, especially about those bombers and jets. Not only did she refer to the aircraft as bombers and jets, but the letter was written in English. 13. Chapter 22. One of the other skills I received when I came here allowed me to understand what was written and said. The skill also let other people understand me, even though I spoke a different language. When I read the different languages, the words are translated in my head, sort of like my own translator. However, this note from Christina, one of the rebel army leaders, was written in English. I had some knowledge of English, but I would have not understood any of these words if I didn't have my translation skill. I immediately requested any information about Christina, but there was nothing unusual apart from her being knowledgeable ever since she was young. When she graduated, she started her own business, using the money from her own family. Her company became one of the biggest only in two years. After her parents died of illness, she succeeded as the family head. Nothing suggested that she was someone like me, who suddenly appeared in this world. The only other theory I can think of was that she was reincarnated or taught the knowledge by someone else. No matter what it was, I wanted to meet her to get my answer. I ordered an espionage unit to deliver a note to her. I decided to clear my head, so I went outside to take a breather. As usual, I had two units accompanying me. Our base was slowly expanding, with more extensive walls and watchtowers. I also increased our number of warehouses, hangars and factories. We completed our plans to build train routes and are currently calculating the cost and time needed. The workshop was building the train. I wanted a uniquely made train to transport all sorts of things. Since this world had wild monsters roaming around, and possible attacks from bandits, I wanted machine guns to be placed on them. However, I doubt that bandits would try and attack a train. And I recently received news that those three people we allowed to leave had all died. Two of them died during the apocalypse and the other one's body was found in the river. The last person's death was suspicious, so I sent a team to examine the body. Excuse me, I turned around to see Elrond and the other elves. Speaking of elves, after Elora was given her sniper rifle, I wanted to know how the other elves would do with sniper rifles. The answer was they were really good, particularly Elrond. The elves had the power to use wind magic, and so in shooting, the bullets were not affected by the wind. They were also able to increase its range or sometimes change its trajectory slightly if they could get the timing right. One rule they had to obey was that sniper rifles had to be stored in the armory. Every time they took it out, it was logged to ensure that the rifles were not misused. Miniature tracking devices were placed in them as well. What's up? I asked. We've begun to feel a powerful presence within this forest, and every day it's getting stronger and stronger. Do you have any idea what it is? We unsure what it is exactly, but it's an extremely powerful spirit. Hmm, would you be able to tell where it is? Yes, we should be able to. Good, I will send a team to scout it out. I want you to accompany them. Understood. Will we be allowed to use our rifles? Requested Elrond. I guess they wanted to try out their rifles. Yes, you can. There are kits prepared for you in the armory as well. And take one of the Hueys. Diamond suit, diamond suit, diamond suit. A few hours later... The earth began to shake. The birds all took air, and the forest animal cries could be heard. The alarm was sounded. All the people stopped what they were doing and ran back to their houses. They followed all the procedures correctly, which would make our job much more manageable. Oh, I should explain what happened. The elves and the units were sent to investigate this spirit. The location was the place where we buried all the dead monsters' remains. The only difference was that there was now a massive tree where the small tree was. The tree's growth was because all the mana from the buried monster corpse was absorbed. This made the tree grow as if hundreds of years had passed. This made the tree become a spirit, which the elves could communicate, as spirits loved them. Apparently, it uses some power to talk telepathically, so the units couldn't hear them since they weren't living beings. This tree wanted to help us and sort of like repay the monster corpse food we unintentionally gave. 
What the tree offered was a boast of our crops and protection. Elrin told me to take the offer since spirits could be powerful allies. I wasn't sure at first, but he said a master-servant pact could be formed between me and the tree. So that's why we have a 100-foot-tall walking tree heading our way. I moved out parts of the walls and the gate. We created a massive space in the center of the farms. I watched as the walking tree moved over to the spot and secured itself to the ground. I guess that's how tree relocations work in this world. I was slowly approaching the tree when I heard a deep voice booming in my head. Hello, you must be the one who helped me grow. I must thank you. I was barely holding surviving then. Ah, uh, no worries about that. It was unintentional anyways, I replied. So you would like to form a contract? Yes, I would very much like that. What I can offer is growth to your crops and my protection against nature. That is very much appreciated. What would you like in return? I ask for nothing in return. You have done so much for me already. Are you really fine with that? Yes, I am confident of my choice. Very well, how do I form a contract? By using this, says Elrond as he suddenly appears with a piece of paper with some pattern drawn onto it. This is a contract scroll. Cool, how do we use it? It requires consent from the to-be servant and master. You need to both hold it, and then it will recognize what needs to be done. I do need to warn you that you must not let go of it, no matter what. I took the scroll, taking Elrin's warning to heart and firmly held it against the tree. The scroll itself began to glow, and then flames burst out from nowhere, completely covering my hand. However, I felt no heat or pain. After it was done burning, I suddenly felt a new connection within my body as if a new door had just been opened. I explained this feeling to Elrond, who explained that a connection is made within our souls. This is how we gained a new residence and ally, a big-ass tree. 12. Chapter 23 We sent a unit to deliver a message to Christina, who knew how to write English. I was curious to know how she knew a language from Earth. If she was like me, this meant I wasn't the only person from Earth in this world and that there was a possibility that there were others. The message only had a location and time for us to meet. Of course, I wasn't going to meet face to face. I had a small tablet that we would use to do a video call. Two units were dispatched to the location, where a carriage was already there. A group of five armored knights guided the units onto the carriage, and inside was Christina, who was barely awake. There you guys are. Why does the meeting have to be now? If only I had some coffee, she complained. A unit on my command hands over the tablet to Christina, who looks at it with glistening eyes. Oh my word, a tablet, I haven't seen one in a very long time, she exclaims excitedly. Hello there, I greeted. Oh, hello. So I guess you're this mysterious leader? Yes, I am. So why did you want to meet? Well, I guess you know that I am from Earth as well. Indeed, it was quite a surprise. Haha, <laughs> anyways. I want to know why there are modern weapons in this world. You look too young to have access to weapons. So how did you do it? It's a power that I was granted when I came to this world. Did you not get the same thing? No, I was reincarnated into this world when I died back on Earth. Growing up without technology is quite hard in this world. Ah, I assumed reincarnation was the case. Mine I asked who you were in your past life? Of course. I grew up in America and got educated in business. I started my first online business when I was 23 which made me a millionaire by the time I was 35. When I was 40, my plane crashed and I died. Then the next thing I knew, I was a newborn baby. That certainly is a tale. Well, how about you? Erm, um, remember when I said I got my power when I was transported into this world? I might have sacrificed my memories to get that power, so I don't even remember my name. Bro, seriously? Damn, why couldn't I get a choice of power? Now I'm stuck in the middle of a war. Ah, uh, that reminds me. How did you get dragged into this war? My father in this world owed a big favor to Otis's family. But when he died, the responsibility fell onto my hands. Some things happened, and I had to supply the rebel army with money to repay that favor. Christina was clearly not happy as she vented out. All I wanted to do was live an easy life, maybe even get married and have children. Well, this war should end after you take the capital. My intelligence team suggests that Orklarth is on his final straw. The capital city is on full lockdown, with only a couple of thousand troops to defend. Whoa, really? Just how good are your men? Actually, who are these people? They're not really people. Units deactivate disguise. The units did as I said and deactivated their disguises, which I thought would have scared Christina. 
but her eyes were again glistening, even brighter. Well, as you can see, they are basically robots. To be honest, I have no idea how they work, but all I know is that they are intelligent and ferociously loyal to me. That is so cool, she shouts. Yeah, I guess it is. So what else do you want to talk about? Oh yeah, I want to join you. Why? Have you not realized? Christina's expression suddenly turns serious. After the rebels win, there's going to be another war. Another war? Yes, between the other three. If you think about it, who would rule the empire after we win? They each have their own ambitions, and even though they are allies, they will turn on each other. But that's if another country doesn't attack before that. And what about you? I just want a peaceful life, and if I was to align myself with one of them, I would never get that. I have my own territory and people to take care of, so I hope someone like you would share the same opinion as me. Of course, we would be glad to have you after this war. But for now, I don't think you should let any of the others know of this meeting. In fact, my spies have actually just restrained someone who has been following you for quite a while now. Why am I not surprised, she says whilst rolling her eyes. Christina's last comment made me chuckle, and I couldn't agree more. Haha <laughs> fine. I'll send over a written contract soon. I'll also leave those two units with you. I do need to warn you that they are both armed. I wanted them to protect Christina but also watch over her just in case she wasn't being truthful. They already sound better than my own bodyguards. Haha <laughs> well, have a good night. Oh, one more thing, can I keep this tablet? Air, there's literally nothing on that tablet and the most you can do is a video call. We can maybe create something similar to the internet, but it will take time. The tablet was a quick and simple item that the workshop created. I had my own special high-end tablet. However, I mainly used my phone, which had all the classified information stored on it. No one should be able to access it unless they knew my password and had my fingerprint. This specific model was our worst performance model compared to the others, and thus was named the Disposables. Its manufacturing cost was low, so it was used for this meeting. Yes, please. I want to be the first one to experience the internet again. Haha, <laughs> of course. Christina's suggestion of the internet gave me an idea. But it was an idea that would take a very long time to accomplish. Before that, we should introduce things like the telephone. 17. Chapter 24. In the royal palace, people were disputing whether to surrender or fight to the death against the rebel army. Already half the nobles had escaped with all their riches to start life in a different land, and it seemed to be quite a popular choice. However, this infuriated Orklarth, who became the emperor nearly 14 years ago after he had his brother's whole family murdered, and as the second son, he was next in line. After ascending to the throne, he ruled with an iron fist. He immediately raised the tax, which led to corruption amongst the noble ranks. He gave away important titles for money such as the general of his army, to someone who paid 10,000 gold coins, and now he was nowhere to be seen. He spent his days drinking, hiring high-class prostitutes, and all the most beautiful noble daughters, no matter their age, had to serve him in his chambers at night at least once. He could get anything he wanted now that he had the title of emperor. However, everything was falling apart for him. Soldiers were leaving their duties and joining the rebel side. Dragons had appeared and decimated his army twice. All that he had left was an army of 2,000 troops and forced conscripted civilians no matter their age or gender. Against an army of a 60,000 rebel fighters, it would be seconds before the capital fell, and he would be executed for his atrocious crimes. That's why he had the 2,000 soldiers and forced conscripts to defend whilst he made his escape. He took all the gold jewels and loaded them onto a carriage along with six of his twenty unofficial wives. He didn't have an empress because that would require him to impregnate her and have heirs, but Orkloth was infertile. No matter how many women he tries it with, none of them could get pregnant. Of course, he blames it all on the women, and since none of them wants to die, they accept it as their fault. They escape through the secret tunnels a day before the rebels arrived and into the darkness in the dead of night. However, they did not know that someone had been waiting for them this whole time. I was staring in the bathroom mirror in my giant mansion, where I lived alone. Since we expanded by taking down some trees, I had more houses built in their own dedicated area, called the Living District. Now each family had their own houses whilst the children who had no parents lived together in a mansion, and were looked after by a volunteering single mother who stayed there with her own son. 
all the trees cut down were used to reconstruct places that suffered damage from the apocalypse. The wood apparently was top quality, so all the extras were being sold to purchase other materials. Sometimes I find that living in a giant mansion by myself is a waste, though I might have a guest who visits me during the night. That's another story. But Ayumi keeps saying that it was necessary to show off my power, but to whom I had no idea. I sighed to myself as I ruffled through my black hair and then made all sorts of different expressions, some serious and some stupid. I wonder if influential people in my old world ever do such things. The thought kept running through my head, and I still couldn't believe it. In a few more days, I was going to create my own nation, and I would be its king. Our current territory was relatively small compared to the other country, and Christina, our newest ally, was cut off from us due to the small amount of land between us. So more troops were going to be sent there just in case. I took off my shirt and looked at my body. I was considerable tall at the height of 1.80 m, and I was slightly underweight according to the medical unit. I think my age is roughly 20, but I wasn't sure. In this world, and in my old world, I would seem like someone young and inexperienced in leading a country. But once the civilians know that all these new improvements and support were from me and my small army, they might welcome us with open arms. When I brought up this same topic, Ayumi and the units mentioned something scary that I had to force myself to forget. I think they wanted to massacre people until they acknowledged me. But who knows? I forgot, okay, moving on from the forbidden topic, I needed to name myself. Ever since I came to this world, I'm only known as Supreme Commander, which gives me a dictator feel, which isn't technically wrong. Ayumi would come up with some absurd names, so asking her was a no. I was left to think of my own name whilst contemplating this new life. Not just that, I also needed to think of a name for my new country. Whilst I was deep in thought, I didn't notice that someone had entered the bathroom. Geez, have you fallen for yourself now? She says, which made me chuckle whilst I embraced her. After having breakfast, I parted from my mansion and headed to my office, where Yumi had a cup of tea and tons of reports for me. Good morning, Supreme Commander. Here are some reports and documents for you to review and sign. Is there anything that needs my immediate attention? I asked as I sat down. Yes, I have placed them at the top in order of priority. Perfect, I said as I took a sip of tea whilst reading the first report, which was the status of the war. It seems that we've managed to place an espionage unit within the servants working within the palace. It gave us a direct pipeline of new intel. Apparently, the remaining nobles were turning against each other on whether they should surrender or fight. Those loyal wished to fight to the death, while the rest knew they would all die if they stayed. The emperor himself was already planning to escape with all his treasure, and six of his twenty unofficial wives. Ayumi, what do you think our best course of action should be in this case? The emperor cannot be allowed to get away, but since we have already announced that we have stopped helping them, we cannot directly do anything. We can, however, send in a unit to intercept them, but that would mean we have to keep his capture a secret. The people who suffered under his rule would want to see him pay for his crime, and us holding him could be a ticking time bomb. Our best options include slipping the information to the rebel spies, but it will be difficult as their spy network is small. Or we can simply give the information to Christina, who can give it to the rebels since she technically is still working with them. The only problem is that we cannot trust Christina just yet. However, my final solution has the highest chance of success. We'll have the spy unit who has already snuck in to slip the word of the Emperor's escape to the nobles, specifically the opportunistic ones. If they are smart, they will use this opportunity to get on the good side of the rebels by handing over either the information or the emperor himself. That's a good plan, especially if you think it has the highest chance of success, so we will proceed with that. Messengers are not that fast at this time, so it is almost certain that the emperor will be met with force. Understood. Saluted Ayumi as she left the room to pass on the order. I placed the first sheet of paper on the completed pile, turned to the rest, and cited. It was going to be a long morning. 13. Chapter 25. A Random Prisoner's POV. I was an apprentice mage within the Sorenth Empire Mage Cannon Unit. My master was the leader. Even though I had not completed my training, I was sent to fight against the rebellion that had risen after the Blood Moon Apocalypse. During the Blood Moon Apocalypse, the Emperor took advantage of the situation and sold all the stored food for profit. That led to the rebellion. 
I personally wanted to fight with the rebels since I agreed that what the emperor was doing was wrong, but the rebels were up against a large army, and there was a chance that the rebels would lose. The last rebellion that took place was when Emperor Orcloth took the throne. Two large rebelling noble houses and their army were outnumbered and crushed within a week. So I stayed. Even with the price increase for food, I could still buy enough food for my mother and younger brother with my small salary, but nothing else. My first battle was a siege against the small town, and I was in charge of channeling my magic into the cannons and doing the calculations to ensure that it would hit the target. After we finished channeling, we would drink a potion made with akuto leaves, which boosts the regeneration of mana and helps with exhaustion. My second battle didn't go so well. The mage cannon unit was stationed right at the back, where enemy forces needed to pass the main force to reach us. We doubled their numbers and had better equipment, or so we thought until explosive spells rained down on us from the sky. We had no idea what it was, and so we panicked. My master commanded us to change the cannons to aim upwards, but I protested. The magic cannons wouldn't even reach that high and would explode in the air or fall back down. Either way, my master did not listen and commanded the others to do so. But before the first cannon could get calibrated, I heard a loud groan from my master as he suddenly dropped to the ground. Not just him, other mages also began to collapse. I looked around to see tens of people approaching. They were wearing armor that had the color of the forest, and they only said one thing, stay down, or else you die. I felt nothing but fear at that moment. I sensed these people were serious, and immediately laid down on the ground. I then heard hell all around me, and I fainted. When I woke up, I was in a small room, lying on a bed. My mage clothes and equipment were all gone. Instead, I was wearing bright orange clothes. I climbed out of bed and towards the door, where I could see through a small glass window. Opposite me was another door, and inside I could see someone I recognized from the same unit as me. She, too, was wearing the same orange clothes as me. I shouted to get her attention, and she rushed to her door. Both of us had no idea where we were, but all she knew was that we were taken onto a giant metal box that flew. This place we were at was a prison, but it didn't feel like a prison at all. It felt more like a comfortable room in an inn. We heard footsteps that belonged to the people who attacked us during our conversation, and we stopped talking. They opened the doors to our supposed cells. Move was all they said, and we complied. These people were the strangest bunch of people I have ever seen, from the mass that covered their faces to their armor and weapons. We were then led to a giant room, where I could hear the sounds of a crowd. At first, I thought there was a fight amongst the other prisoners, and a group had formed around it. But when we looked closer, we saw that the two people weren't fighting. Instead, they were playing a board game that had many wooden pieces on top. Each of their faces was serious and the crowd was cheering them on. After they moved several of the pieces, one shouts checkmate, whilst the other looks in defeat. I then saw one of the leaders of a different mage unit. We approached him to see if he knew what was going on, and all he knew was that most of these prisoners were also from the Sorenth Empire army. The game they were playing was called chess, and they would bet all sorts of things against each other, like food. I imagined at first that there was not enough food for everyone, which was why they were betting their meals. However, when we were taken to the dining hall, I could smell a mouth-watering aroma that I had never sensed before. The other prisoners were clearly excited about the aspect of lunch, and I was in agreement. We waited in line with a metal tray while some prisoners had chef clothes on serving the food to the other prisoners. I was given a bowl of something white and fluffy, along with a hearty portion of meat and vegetables. I had never felt so hungry and happy as I wolfed down all my food. Then finally it was time for the desserts, a sweet, spongy cake with a slight hint of lemon and cream. I looked around to see that everyone was enjoying their meal, even my old squad mates. After the food, we went back to our rooms, and after five minutes of rest, I was called out by one of the prison soldiers. They took me to a dimly lit interrogation room and asked me all sorts of questions. And like I thought, all they were asking me was information about the Empire, army formations, and any plans that I knew. But since I was an apprentice mage, I knew nothing of the sorts. All I knew was the magic that my master taught me, which seemed to pique their interest. Then they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse, especially as a prisoner of war. I would be freed if only I showed and taught them how the magic cannons worked. I was eager to see my family again, so I agreed, 
with the other condition being that the other mages would be too. I explained how everything worked in a magic cannon for the next four days and how the procedures were done. At some point, a couple of elves came to watch me as I was explaining. They were known to be masters of wind magic and archery, and known for their beauty regardless of gender. I was also given more food, more free time, and generally better treatment. Probably the best thing I received was the news that my family was safe. The prison officers told me that as long I was helping them, they would guarantee the safety of my family and me. 16. Chapter 26. Our plan went as planned. We had the espionage made unit give out the information on the emperor's attempt to escape to all the opportunistic nobles as if it were supermarket coupons. The nobles bought off some of the soldiers to intercept the emperor as he left the castle during the night. They sent a messenger to the rebels to tell them they had turned against the emperor and would hand him over by morning. In return, they would all be spared. The loyal faction had all run away before the rebel army marched on the capital. They might cause some trouble in the future, so I made sure to keep tabs on them. The ex-emperor was tied to a post in the center of the city. He would be screaming for help whilst all the citizens threw rocks and rotten food, and someone even set up a stall that sold horse excrement, which they would throw at him. It was highly profitable, apparently. Even though it might be inhumane, the emperor did starve his own people to earn profit. Plus, we can't interfere with what they do with their prisoners. Now that the war had ended, the rebel army was disbanded. Each of the lords returned to their territories, which I assume was to gather an army to fight. The three main lords, Otis, Nevar, and Tristan, needed to decide who would lead the empire, and all three wanted the throne. Christina, on the other hand, joined us. Her territory was slightly far away and was surrounded by the empire. So, I immediately took a ride along with a hundred units to build a military outpost. It was equipped with landing pads, hangars, several computer-controlled M61 Vulcan machine guns stationed on each corner of the base, and among other things. There was also enough space for a single runway for planes to land. I built a slightly smaller command center, but it had long-range communication capabilities and an underground bunker nearly impossible to break into. I left 500 new combat units to protect the base. After I finished building, I went to stay at Christina's mansion to have a chat. Her knowledge was going to be extremely helpful, especially with business. Our factories could produce modern goods, as long as we had the suitable materials. Many things in this world did not exist on Earth, and vice versa. So we had begun searching far and wide to find replacements. One amazing discovery was a plant that the hunters used to make poison arrows and traps. The lab was able to remove the toxic components of the plant and then turn it into a drug that could cure colds. I showed her a list of potential items that we could start manufacturing, but it was best to have them tested beforehand since we weren't familiar with the living situation in this world. I had a large box of random household products delivered to her and her retainers to try out. Though for Christina... She was experiencing things from Earth again. I did the same for Roland, Aiden, and their retainers as well. Next was about trading, which Christina understands the best out of all of us since she has her own company. With the goods that you have shown me so far, maybe we should build supermarkets in most of the major towns, suggests Christina. These items would change everyday life. That's doable, but we would need a new method of transport to deliver the goods to each place. For now, we can use trucks but there aren't any proper roads made yet, so it will take them longer. Why don't you also build a railway system? You can probably make a decent amount of money by providing transport to not only travelers but also merchants and their goods. That would sort out quite a few problems in terms of transport. You know that we won't be able to build one in your territory. I know, and there should be a way for you to do it. Is that so? You see that the land that separates mine and Aiden's belonged to a minor lord that followed Otis. However, it seemed like he owed a lot of money to a crime syndicate that set up a drug farm in that place. During the war, I was in charge of sorting out the funds for rebellion when one of my subordinates noticed that the minor lord was claiming funds for 2,000 troops when we received word that he only has a 1,000 soldiers. So he was essentially embezzling money from the funds, which I assume was mostly donated by you. That's right. So I sent some people over to him to talk but he says there was nothing wrong and sent them away. Though the next day, he was mysteriously dead in a brothel. Perhaps he couldn't handle the excitement, she says with a chuckle, sending shivers down my spine. 
Uh, remind me not to mess you with when it comes to money. Haha, <laughs> it's alright. Plus, technically, now all the money I would be handling would be yours. Ha, huh, what do you mean? Don't tell me you weren't going to place someone random in charge of the country's money? No, of course not. But I was planning on having a group of units to be in charge. Oh wait, I forgot, you had that amazing power, says the now dejected Christina. Be but you can take the role of managing all the government business, like the supermarkets. I quickly returned without thinking. Perfect, now that I have a role, I shall do my best at it. Christina's expression changed back to her usual cheery self. And that was when I realized that she played me like a fiddle. Now, back to the main topic. The crime syndicate is called the Ivory Death, and they were growing something called death poppies to make their drugs. From what I've heard, these plants would drain the soil of all its minerals. Do you know what type of drugs they're making? Nope, just that much. I didn't particularly look into them much since they've never bothered me. But I know that this syndicate is almost in every country, selling drugs, assassinations, kidnapping and the list goes on. I hope you can prevent them from growing in our new country. Of course, we will make sure that them or any other syndicates won't be able to grow. The death poppies sparked my interest, and no, I'm not going to grow them. Wait, technically, I will if they prove to be helpful. Poppies from Earth could also be used to make morphine, a powerful pain relief medication. If the death poppies could be used, we could equip future hospitals and our medics with them. But I would probably grow them in a lab and enlist the help of our tree spirit friend. Secondly, the bit of land that belonged to the embezzling noble now belonged to Otis. If it was in a seriously bad state, like Christina says it was, then surely Otis wouldn't mind us purchasing it from him. Otis definitely needed the money to raise an army if he was to try and take the throne for himself. So I just needed to make sure that the offer was presented at the right moment. So I planned to go home to consult with Ayumi. Oh, and before you go, I have a merchant acquaintance in the kingdom of Hayami who bought me some interesting news. Behind the abyssal forest are giant mountains, and behind that is the kingdom of Hayami. It's an isolated country that could only be accessed by sea since the mountains and forests were perilous and impossible to hike. Since we were landlocked, we could not travel by sea to reach that country. Being landlocked meant that we didn't need to have a navy but the downside was that trading with countries even further away was not possible. I also craved seafood now that my rice needs were satisfied. There was just no way to get seafood in an inland territory, and this world's quickest transport method was a speedy horse. But modern technology is our savior in this case. Just imagine all the delicious seafood I could eat. I'm not even going to ask what you are thinking about, but as I was saying, this merchant friend told me that the country was in the middle of a civil war. Civil war? Yes, it seems the country's prime minister wants to throne himself. So he has borrowed an army from several island tribes. And are they winning? They are. However, I'm not sure about the exact details. But it seems that the prime minister used his power to move the army and take the capital. All I'm saying as your newly appointed minister of business is if you help the young queen to regain control. Opening up trade might be much easier. My dream of eating seafood might be coming true. 11. Chapter 27 The units were the perfect soldiers. They don't need sleep, food, or water. All they needed was a couple of hours of recharge, and they're good for about two weeks. The workshop had finally finished with the replaceable batteries for the units that had a miraculous increase of three weeks of charge, plus many more items that I had requested. Even though the units were made of metal, they would still break. I plan on having every unit wear these helmets, which would hide their face completely. The eye area is covered by a panel of glass that only the wearer can see through. It's designed so that even humans can wear it. They would also be equipped with basic body armor, which would cover up the rest of their bodies without hindering their performance. The final item was something necessary. A grenade disrupted the mana in a specific area, preventing magic from being cast. Made using the help of elves and the one apprentice mage prisoner. Some incantations can be activated when written down. However, they tend to be longer and more sophisticated spells. The workshop was able to print out the incantation in tiny fonts onto the inside of a metal cylinder. When the grenade pin is pulled and the handle flies off, a small but thick piece of silver activates the incantation on the inside. We found silver to be able to store mana for the longest time after numerous testing. Apparently, the best mana conductor was mithril, but it was a costly and rare material unsuitable for mass production. The grenade prevented any spells from activating in a two and a half meter radius for 30 seconds, 
which was definitely enough time for the units. Also, I decided to have a much larger anti-magic ward around the prison. This one was powered by a silver pipeline connected to a silver mana bank. The mana came from all the excess mana that the tree spirit did not need. Most human mages required something like a staff to be able to channel the mana for their spell. Only the top tier human mages were able to chant without it. On the other hand, the elves had large amounts of mana as part of their genetics, which allowed them to cast their spells without using a medium. The workshop was making great progress and making our army more efficient. However, I noticed a few things that I did not authorize the workshop to do, such as the large portrait of me with a frame made of pure gold and the presidential limo with a gold outer layer. I immediately knew who was behind this. Are you me? You are hereby banned from ordering from the workshop. Wait, Supreme Commander, please reconsider. No. In the end, Yumi retreated, and her attempts to restore her privileges were stopped. For now. What is the plan to send messengers to the Kingdom of Hayami? I asked Yumi. We plan to send a group of units to act as messengers to the Kingdom, which was in the middle of a civil war. It would take several weeks to travel by boat, and they might not arrive in time. Our best option is to have them go by parachuting from AC-130 Hercules or send a large platoon in a Chinook, though mid-flight refueling is required. Flying over another country usually is not a good idea. However, there are no agreements on airspace between countries, so nothing stops us from doing so. I will create five state route 71 blackbirds and have them fly around. I want to know where the prime minister and the queen stand. Knowing the land before we sent in our own troops will make the difference. Understood, also the expansion of the forest is complete. We approximately control 10% of the forest. The abyssal forest is around 4 million square kilometers, which is smaller than the Amazon rainforest. The forest, however, contains immeasurable amounts of dangerous monsters but resources that can make a country very wealthy. From what we know, the Serenth Empire had actually attempted to conquer the forest 40 years ago and built villages. However, the pioneers and villages were devastated by the monsters. And so, it was abandoned, and the rich lands and treasures were left untouched. However, even though we could take the forest, I do not plan to destroy the ecosystem, which is a serious matter on Earth. We can prevent environmental disasters before they happen. We have plans to use renewable energy when possible. For example, the trains we will make will be powered using one of the batteries made during our testing. It had the most extended life but was way too big. We have farmlands blessed by the tree spirit, which accelerates the growth of crops, allowing us to harvest once every three to four weeks. It seems like they have a general idea of crop rotation and its effectiveness in this world. Supreme Commander, it's time for the meeting. Ayumi reminded me as the large screen on the wall opposite my desk turned on. We've had these meetings once every couple of days to keep me updated on what happens in our territories. But today's main discussion was about the Hayami Kingdom's civil war and how we should approach them. If we were to announce ourselves as a new nation, having another nation's backing would make things smoother. We are all in agreement. At the moment, the only other country is the Serenth Empire, which at the moment does not even have a leader, says Roland. Trade routes are vital for a country. It's hard to get goods from other continents in the empire. If we manage to secure a route, merchants from inland would be coming here to purchase them says Christina, who is always looking for ways to profit apparently. Plus, we have our own goods to sell. Indeed, those makeup products are loved by all the ladies within my household, especially my wife. Speaking of which, I will have to request for some more, asked Aiden with a sigh. Me too, added Roland with a sigh as well. I guess modern makeup has a lot of power in this world, especially with the wives of nobility. 10. Changes. So I am finally back from revising and exams. Thank God for that. For the past week or so, I have been changing my story, particularly things that I thought were a good idea at first but then regretted. This does change the story a bit. However, it's nothing too significant. You can reread everything or just read the rest of this as I have written everything that I have changed. 1. A new system. At first, the MC had a system that would give him special rewards and increases his troop limit. That system was a bit tedious to write and hard to keep track of how many troops he had created so far. Furthermore, I watched a YouTube video about Star Wars clone troopers and how big the Grand Army of the Republic Army was, which made me realize that the MC does not have a big enough army. So to fix this, 
he now has a leveling system. Of course, he starts at level 1, and at the end of chapter 27, it is at level 20. When a unit kills monsters, he gains XP, but I decided killing humans would not give him any. Well, I say I decided, but really I just flipped a coin, smiley face. It also made tallying how many soldiers the MC has easier. 2. No more resource crystals. Not that there was much of it. At first, I thought it was an excellent idea, but then I decided to trash it. The power to be able to make any material was OB, but it didn't line up with his army building powers, hence why I removed it. 3. Quantity issues. At first, the rebel army had 200,000, but that was too many for a rebellion. So I made it smaller by downsizing it to a 100,000. It was going to be smaller, but not everyone was trained soldiers in rebellions. So I wanted to include a large number of civilians who chose to stand with the rebels. 4. Smaller changes. Some weapons have changed. For example, the main gun was the 33 Hong Kong dollars. But after someone had updated its wiki page, I realized it was made in 1968. The new weapon I decided to use was the FNFL. I rolled a wheel which had rifles that I thought would be suitable, like the AK or the AR-15. More tanks, more bombers, more destruction. I think that sentence alone should tell you what changed. Also, I changed the dragon bone to dragon fang instead. To be honest, I might have missed some things, but that's just me being silly and not writing down all the changes I have made. If you do reread and notice something has changed, but I did not write it here, feel free to let me know. Watch I think about the changes. Yeah it's cool, but be quicker next time. Don't really mind. Eh? WTF is this? No, just no. Total voters, 22. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Watch I think about the changes. 2. Chapter 28. The rumor of a mysterious military force that has taken the abyssal forest seems to have spread. From what I have heard, a couple of them makes us seem quite devilish, said Roland. What do you mean? I asked. For example, one of the popular ones is that we have mind-controlling magic, to create soldiers etc. My favorite is that we sacrifice people to control the dragons, chuckles Christina. However, the people within our territories know that all the supplies and new improvements come from our sinister organization, so they will be hard to persuade to believe these rumors. Aiden also joins in with a joke. Do we have any idea where these rumors are coming from? Mostly from the Empire, so I assume that either Otis or Tristan is behind it. Navar wouldn't use such tactics, but that's because he's got muscles for brains, explained Christina, as she had the most interaction with them. It could also be the Loyalist faction, who are still on the run, Roland suggested. We have units tracking them down, but most of them are staying low, I answered. Fair enough. I'm surprised that those old traditional fools are staying low, says Christina. Why is that? I asked. Well, contrary to what you might think about the Loyalist faction, their loyalty doesn't lie with Orklarth but with the family itself. The Loyalists were loyal as long as whoever was on the throne had the right to be in the first place. Plus, with the Emperor now imprisoned, and soon to be executed, who knows what they will do next, added Roland. Though there is a high chance they would try and free Orkloth to restore the Empire, the Loyalist faction could cause problems depending on their actions. If they managed to free the Emperor, they could start another war to reclaim the Empire, and we would be right at square one. Though it was a problem that could be easily solved, none of us really showed any concern on our faces. Even if they managed to restore the Empire, it would be even weaker than before, allowing the Western Union to easily storm through it. Christina, I will also dispatch a battalion stationed in your territory, as I have done with Roland and Aiden. Similarly, they will listen to your orders unless it is for personal gains or not within our interest. I understand. The next thing I want to talk about is the human supremacy that the Empire was known for ever since Orkloth took the throne. We shall be known to allow races like demi-humans into our territories. Are we all in agreement? I'm certainly fine with that. The demi-humans are known for their unique traits, like the beast people and their strength. Not only would it increase our reputation, but also our workforce, says Aiden. I agree with Tristan, not just the beast people, though. The giants are also known for their strength. I can't tell you how much help they were before Orkloth took the throne. I agree very much with that. As a merchant, I have done business with demi-humans, especially the dwarves, known for their craftsmanship. They dabble from furniture to weapons, 
and anything they make is guaranteed to be top tier. Christina, as always, looked at the business aspect of things. Perfect. We will need to ensure that any racial discrimination, as well as any type of discrimination, will be punishable. The next thing I want to propose is purchasing the land that belongs to Otis's faction. May I ask where the funds will come from? Otis may only accept coins so that he could pay for his army? asks Roland. Don't worry. We will not take it from the people. Well, that's not true, as it will be the profits from selling our own products in other regions. I entrust Christina with most of the operation. If there is anything that you require, don't hesitate to ask. Are there any concerns? About the manufacturing processes, is there any possible way to hire civilians for some of the jobs? Requests Aiden. His territory had lost two towns and had a problem with slightly overpopulation in a few of his cities. Even with the planned expansion of each city and town, jobs will still be required. That is certainly doable. I will have to check first. As you probably know, there could be some processes we cannot allow people to know. However, production will begin after we become a nation. We will start rolling out our currency at that same time, as I don't particularly want to use empire coins. But until then, we will continue to use them. Our meeting lasted just over two hours, and I had spare time as most of the paperwork was now handled by the office units. They were just as capable as Ayumi, just without the gold obsession. Maybe she has faulty wiring or something but it felt rude and intrusive to say that to her. I took a look at the plan for our future capital city that would be close to our main military base. It was probably going to be one of the biggest cities in this world, with enough space to build housing for nearly a million people. There would be a full running water system for the entire city, and the whole city was supported by an enormous solar energy plant. The main capital building in the center was yet to be named, but it was just a decoy made to be for appearances. Underground bunkers are built for emergencies, though I doubt they would be used much. Moving on, the plans to install a railway system was complete. We have been stocking up on materials as it will be a large project. We have several different models for the trains, like passenger trains, cargo trains, and military trains. All of them have some form of protection, such as an extra layer of a moor or a mounted M61 machine gun. But all our plans would only start after we announced ourselves as a fledgling nation and were backed up by another country like the Kingdom of Hyami, which have a good reputation. We still have to contact the Queen to receive permission to send our troops in. I then suddenly spot a report that I had completely forgotten to read. The remnant of the Empire was on a hunt, specifically a treasure hunt. It was widely known that the Emperor had increased the tax, except they didn't know where all the tax money was stored. When the rebel army entered the capital palace, the place was completely looted. They found artifacts, gems, and treasures in the vault, except the tax money he ordered to be collected. Apparently, the amount of money was nothing to sneeze at. No one knew where the money had gone, and our spies came up with nothing until now. One high-ranking finance advisor stole all the money and smuggled it around disguised in barrels. Supreme Commander, I would like you to sanction a black ops mission. I assume it's to do with all the stolen money? That is correct. I would like to deploy our black ops unit to recover the stolen money. It will definitely tip the balance if it is found by any of the three lords. I don't feel fine taking it either. The people of the empire are already suffering enough if they were to be taxed anymore. No one would be able to survive. What if we were to anonymously donate most of the money? We may not be able to return all of it to the people, but we could make their lives more bearable. Hmm. That's certainly a good idea. Fine, you have my approval. Plan the mission beforehand, and see if you can incorporate any of our experimental weapons. I gave the go-ahead for the Black Ops mission, and I was left alone as Ayumi eagerly skipped out of my office. I felt my body shiver when I remembered that there would be a load of gold coins retrieved during the mission. Let's just hope that Ayumi doesn't have any make-me-look-rich ideas. 7. Chapter 29 Fast under the moonlight was a line of heavily guarded wagons. They were supposed to be carrying military food and weapon supplies on paper, but what they were really carrying was all the lost tax money. As they traveled towards the top of the hill, the horses pulling the carriages began to panic. Several people fell off their horses, and carriages were flipped over each other. Immediately several of the guard escorts were immobilized, but those that managed to escape from the chaos weren't left out. They began to lose all sorts of feelings in their muscles and slowly began to lose their consciousness. It was a planned ambush to take out many of them at once and cause a commotion. 
The horses were only hit with a needle that would be absorbed by their own body and leave minimal traces. The needles weren't laced with anything as it was only used to rile up the horses to cause a distraction. The panic that the horses cause pushes the guards to breathe more rapidly that they don't even know they are breathing in a knockout gas. Nor did they know they were not going to wake up ever again. The next day after the Black Ops money recovery mission, I had all the money counted and stored in our secret underground treasury. We had deployed a few of our experimental weapons, such as the disappearing needle and knockout gas, made using material from this world. There were over 40,000 gold coins and 200,000 silver coins. I then had the money placed in small pouches and had the espionage units deliver them anonymously to struggling families, businesses, and orphanages. I tried to exchange as many of them for copper or silver coins so that it would be much easier for them to use. In the end, we only kept half of the gold coins and none of the silver coins. 20,000 gold coins were a lot of money, even for some nobility, and we would probably use most of it for outside activities. When I meant outside activities, it meant covert missions that would take place in another country, whether it could be espionage or even sabotage. We also decided to take some of the horses as last-minute spoils, as I figured the elves or farmers might have a use for them. However, as it turns out, the farmers have been happily using the tractors that we've provided them, whilst the elves have taken an interest in motorcycles. The word surprised would not even describe what I felt when I spotted a few of them doing donuts and wheelies in our vehicle parking lot. I had given them several homemade bikes to test out. We even have a bike with a minigun attached to the front, though that model is still in its testing phase and not yet fully operatable. Its biggest issue is probably its increased weight at the front, and we are still working out a solution. There was one solution which was to use magic, precisely one that can decrease the weight of an object. However, none of the elves or our POW mages knows weight magic. Speaking of POWs, we've received several requests to release some of our high-profile prisoners for a price, but not as many for the lower-profile prisoners. It was very likely that their families were trying to gather the ransom money, even though we hadn't told them they needed to pay a ransom. We decided on the POW values by their statuses. A few first and second sons of noble families that managed to escape punishment were happy to pay for their return. In truth, we had planned to release all our POWs, and we still intend to. But if we were going to get paid for a few of them, there was no way I was going to say no to that. The mages assisting us were relatively low-ranking in the army, so not many people except their families wanted to pay for their return. The captains of the mage units, even though they didn't have any noble status, were still valuable due to their knowledge and power. I doubt the low-rank mages would rejoin an army that had forgotten about them, so I decided to give them offers to work for us to develop tools using modern technology and magic. We even offered to move their families over as a bonus. Most of the work at the moment is understanding what different types of magic exist in this world and how we can counter them. We know that there is a country that specializes in magic. It is also where mass-produced magic tools are made. Magic was a very powerful thing that required years to harness its potential power. Sages were apparently people who were unparalleled in magic, but most often, they secluded themselves with research and rarely made a public appearance. Though it would be nice to have a powerful sage work for us so that they can teach us the properties of magic. But I'm kind of afraid because I was told that several years ago, a noble from someplace was harassing a sage, so the sage moved the noble's entire estate around like a jigsaw puzzle. Supreme Commander, I have something urgent that requires your attention. My train of thought was interrupted by Yumi rushing into the office. I didn't mind her doing that as I knew she would not usually interrupt me unless it was an emergency or something urgent. Under your orders, we have begun building a database to store genetic information, so I ordered a unit to collect the ex emperor or Clotha's genetics secretly, as much as I hate to say that. So? Did it go wrong or? No, the opposite. It was very successful. But when we uploaded onto the database, we got cross-database matches. Matches? How's that possible? From what we know, Orklarth never had any kids or other family members still alive. Indeed, the match percentage means that they are a close relative of Orklarth. But that's not the only problem. We have two matches, and each is a nearly 25% match. This is slightly unexpected. Who are they? The sisters, Mina and Lena, and we have already a theory as to how this situation came to be. I'm all ears. 
We theorized that the crown prince had survived the assassination and hid from the watchful eyes of his brother, who then had all the power. We assumed that the assassins weren't very good at their job or falsified the report. A detailed lab report shows that the sisters are only half-sisters. Mina is likely the princess supposed to have died 14 years ago. Surprises came after surprises. This sort of information was critical, since we have unknowingly harbored the only other surviving members of the Sorrenth royal family. No doubt, the loyalist faction would make a move if they had this sort of information. Should I call the sisters in? No, I doubt they would know about it or even think they were actually princesses. Until we can confirm this is true, no one is allowed to know, not even our own allies. Understood, I will move all relevant documents to level zero access and task our spies to confirm our theory. Good. Also, what is the status of the 22nd platoon? Our last contact was when they were refueling just over the mountain. Our next check-in is in one hour, 34 minutes and 42 seconds. Fine. If nothing goes wrong, notify me when they land and establish long-range comms. Remember that we have no intel, so they must proceed with caution. Understood. After Yumi left, I slumped into my chair and sighed deeply with a headache. Things just got more complicated. 7. Chapter 30 Two CH-47 Chinooks finally landed late in the evening after several hours of traveling over the mountains. They carried a small platoon of 40 combat units and supplies, including batteries and ammunition. Their mission was to establish a connection with the Kingdom of Hayami for the future. But first, they needed to set up long-range communication to be able to receive orders from headquarters. And after that, they needed to locate an asset. The asset was a merchant, who had ties with Christina and was also the younger brother of a baron that ruled a small piece of land in the kingdom. The units moved with great speed, setting up a large command tent, and began constructing the small yet powerful communication tower. They carried enough supplies to last them for just over a week, but more would be delivered in a few days. After the communication system was set up and ready to go, they immediately contacted HQ. This is Unit 2222 of the 22nd Platoon, reporting in. We have landed safely and established a makeshift base. Our current location is in Sector X2-3, but we will continue to scout further outwards into Sectors X2-4 to X3-0 in the morning. Unit 2222, this is headquarters. Location and plan have been recorded, and the Secretary and Supreme Commander has been notified. Please report in every so often. Understood, Unit 2222 out. It was the next day after the landing. Not that it mattered much to the units as they did not need sleep. Nothing happened during the night, except for some lone nocturnal monsters who accidentally stumbled upon the camp but turned around once they saw how outnumbered they were. This is Unit 2235, reporting to base camp. Sector X2-7 is clear. However, human remains have been found. Unit 2235, this is base camp. It has been noted. Please provide details of the victim. The victim is a middle-aged male. There are a lot of deep cuts made by multiple weapons and massive amounts of dried blood. He has a missing left arm, an ear, and a right thigh that seem to have been gnawed off by scavengers. He has nothing notable except a couple of copper coins. It is unlikely the work of bandits. Acknowledged, the victim is likely someone from the village in Sector S4-5. Carry on with the scouting mission. A small squad has been dispatched to collect the body. The next day... New information arrives from an State Route 71 Blackbird that several large ships were sailing down the river. A small squad of units was dispatched to where the ships had landed. They found a camp with roughly 200 bloodthirsty-looking warriors, drinking, eating and wrestling for entertainment. There were also a dozen of giants that wore metal muzzles around their mouths and monster skulls over their heads. Each had the same metal collar around their neck. It was most likely slavery collars. Slavery collars had different grades. For example, ancient grades were able to enslave powerful monsters like dragons. They were rare in general, and to have quite a few of them meant something really abnormal was going on. These large bands of Viking-like warriors called Vigners and Giants matched the army composition that the Prime Minister had under his service, suggesting that they were the enemies. But they had to be sure. With the current intel, it would seem that they raided any villages and towns that lacked proper defenses. The nearest village in Sector S4-5 was likely a target as there were practically no defensive capabilities. A squad of units stayed to watch them as they continued to drink until they were all blacked out. 
Using this opportunity, one unit entered the camp undetected and located the tent that looked like it belonged to the leader of this small army. Inside was a large bearded man snoring away, and around him were lots of marked maps. The unit took pictures of every map and exited the camp, leaving no traces that it was ever there. Several routes were drawn to several large fortresses and towns on each map. They could be secret routes, trade routes, or army supply routes. Whatever it is, they now know a rough idea of the enemy's plan. The next day, a villager out foraging accidentally walks upon the camp. Incidentally, a small group of Vigners relieving themselves in the forest spotted her and began to chase her. She managed to get quite far before her legs couldn't move any longer, and the Vigners slowly caught up. However, they all dropped dead before they reached her, each with a bullet to the head. The villager had no idea where her pursuers had gone, so she assumed she had managed to lose them. Eventually, she makes her way back to warn the village. Back at the temporary command base, there was a message from headquarters. This is HQ, Unit 2222. Please confirm. HQ, Unit 2222 receiving. We have new information on the slavery callers. There should be a master bracer amongst the Vikner warriors to control the giants. However, we do not know how many there are. We are not sure that anti-magic grenades will have any effect. These are the following orders from the Supreme Commander. Though it is doubtful, ask them to surrender first, then use force if they do not comply. The Supreme Commander explicitly asks to use non-lethal weapons on the giants if possible and take the collars and bracers for sampling. Finally, additional supplies are on their way. We have another AC-130 with food supplies and experimental weapon 113. Orders acknowledged. We will meet Supreme Commander's expectations. It was the fifth day after the landing. Following orders, ten units approached the Vigner camp in what might look like a carefree manner. Many of the Vigners were confused by their sudden approach and immediately grabbed the closest weapon they could find. The same Vigner warrior with all the maps in his tent steps up to face the units. Name yourselves. He shouts whilst throwing a small axe at the feet of the units. The units could determine where the axe would land, so they didn't react or move. Our names are irrelevant, nor do we have a use for them. We are here to convey a single message from our leader. Spit it out then. Surrender. There was a moment of silence before the whole camp erupted in laughter. This must be some joke. I am the great Jarlulf, and I won't surrender just because you asked. I guess I will have to deliver your heads back to the foolish lord you serve. That should be enough for a replace. Eagle 6, fire. Suddenly, Wolf began to cry in pain and dropped onto his knees, making the camp go silent. Several snipers were hiding in the forest, and one had taken a shot directly aimed at Ulf's left ear. It ruptured his eardrum and also took off part of his ear. Do not disrespect our leader, or it will be your head next. Now answer, will you fight us or surrender? You bastards kill them now. I want their heads. Giants, come to me now, commanded Ulf in rage. The ground shook as the giants began to unwillingly move toward their master. Ulf had an ominous-looking golden bracer on his right arm, and when he gave a command, a purple marking formed for a few seconds. Experimental Mortar Squad 113, begin bombardment. We have located the master bracer. The targets are east of the camp. All eagles fire at will. Several mortar shells whistled through the air whilst bullets began to rip Vigner warriors apart. Chaos had only just started. 8. Chapter 31 Dozens of mortar shells whistled through the air and landed in the center of the camp. However, instead of exploding, it released high concentrated tear gas, synthesized from a dog-sized frog creature that uses it to escape. Not even a seasoned Vigner warrior could function properly. They also had decent effects on the giants by slightly hindering their sight. Yarlof was immediately taken down by two units using a taser. His arms and legs were cuffed. Another unit grabs a tool from its belt that looks like a thick pen and pushes it against the master bracer. Cracks began to form throughout the bracer before it shattered into several pieces, which were all collected. At the same time, all the slave collars linked to the bracer all stopped working. Even though the giants were still fighting the tear gas, they could feel they had regained control of their whole bodies. Immediately several Vigner warriors were launched into the air by a single stomp from a giant and many more began to follow. Around that time, all the guns had stopped firing just in case they accidentally hit one of the giants who were on a serious revenge streak. The Vigners well simply got what they deserved. The tear gas had begun being dispersed by the mass stomping and from the force created by the giants swinging their massive clubs. 
The video sent back to HQ had jaw-dropping effects and was watched by everyone who had access. In the end, only a handful of Vigner warriors survived, but they were taken as prisoners to be interrogated. The group of giants approached the small platoon of units handling prisoners. I am Baylor, the younger brother of our clan leader. I must thank you, people, for saving us and allowing us the opportunity to avenge some of our fallen. No need to thank us, we act only on our master's orders. It was his wish to see you and your brethren freed. If you must, then it is our master that deserves the praises. However, he is currently unavailable, and we must continue with our mission. Oh, okay. I understand. We also need to free other members of our clan from these savages. Might I ask for details? Yes, of course. And so Baylor continued to tell what had transpired that led to their capture. Several months ago, a group of humans came to their settlement and demanded subordination, which was rejected. The giants had an agreement with the land's lord several generations ago to lie there. But all of a sudden, a group of giants betrayed the clan by colluding with the humans. They held several of the children hostage with the slavery collars. They made the clan leader voluntarily put on a slavery collar along with several others, including Baylor and his group. Even though they weren't in control of their own bodies, they still had some of their senses. All the giants that had been enslaved were split into two groups, each with different missions. Baylor and his companions were ordered to attack key supply lines for the main Jaime army. The other group were sent to fight on the front lines. Baylor's story was being transmitted back to HQ, when new orders were sent back, which were Dash. We will assist in saving the rest of your clan. Our master dislikes betrayal, which he says is a recurring theme in this war. Furthermore, please follow us back to our camp. We have food, water and medical aid for those who need it. Once you're all rested, we will begin moving west down the river to complete the next step of our mission. But where did those order wait, never mind. We are thankful for you and your master's generosity, says Baylor, as he and every other giant bowed in front of the units. Even then, the giants were still taller. Back at the camp, the giants happily ate through MREs, which had been prepared last minute. Each of these MREs weighed over 5 kg and was filled to the brim with meat and vegetables. As slaves, they were fed barely enough for an adult human. After that, they were checked by a medical unit. The prisoners were handcuffed by their arms and legs and were separated apart from each other to prevent them from talking to each other. No food or water was distributed since there were limited supplies. The following day supplies and several jeeps were airdropped. The 24th platoon was also dispatched to take over the temporary base, whilst the 22nd continued their mission to locate the merchant asset. The giants would be updated on anything about the rest of the giant clan whilst they recovered from the horrible treatments they had received. After four days of traveling, the entourage of jeeps finally arrived outside a town. There was a big commotion in the city. No one was familiar with the jeeps or the equipment they were using. The guards hurried to call their lord. What? Whose flag were they carrying? shouted Baron Thuland. No one's, my lord. They ride in these armored metal boxes, all wearing the same strange clothes. They could be soldiers with magical artifacts. Call up all the men. I will head out myself to talk with them. We need to find out who they are affiliated with, and if they are our enemies or not. Understood, my lord. The guard runs out of the room with great speed to gather up all the soldiers and guards they had available. Their numbers just reached a hundred. As the guard left, somebody else came bursting through the door. Brother, I heard that some strange people have arrived outside the walls. Michael? What are you still doing here? I thought you and Maria had already left. Baron Thuland shouted at his younger brother, Michael. Baron Thuland was a short middle-aged man with a small mustache, while his younger half-brother was the opposite. He was young, handsome, and most of all, a demon when talking about business. However, the fifteen-year age difference did not change their bond as brothers. I had Maria and the others go on ahead. There is something that I must do before I leave. Brother, trust me on this, and let me talk to these people on your behalf. Are you crazy? We don't even know who they are and who they are with. Wait. Do you know something about this? Yes, I've been in contact with a fellow merchant who is noble in the former Serenth Empire. She says that she is now serving a new master who has the power to end our civil war, and I trust what she says. Brother, I'm pleading with you to trust me. She took me under her wing and taught me what I know today. If she didn't, I wouldn't have been able to return home. After considering for a while, Thuland reluctantly agreed. 
He knew he could trust his brother but was hesitant for reasons that even he doesn't know himself. Thank you, brother. Minutes later, the wooden gate opened, and Michael and a small group of guards armed with swords walked out. On top of the walls were archers to give covering fire even though they would not be able to deal any damage to the armored cars. Unit 22 approached the group alone but was equipped with an MP5 that could easily mow down a few dozen people at once. I am Michael Thulin the younger brother of Baron Thulin. State your business. Greetings, I am the commander of the 22nd platoon. Lady Christina von Lenixis has a message for you. Michael's expression softens with a smile at the mention of her former teacher. Go ahead. Very well, the unit reaches for the small voice recorder attached to the side of its belt and hits play. What's up, Michael? I hope your business is still doing well because you still owe me that money. You do remember how I punish people who don't pay their debt? Though everyone was surprised by the female voice that came out of the small device, Michael was happy to hear the voice of his former teacher despite the little threat. Also, these guys are the loyal soldiers of the new master I serve. They have something for your brother. Talk to you later. 4. Chapter 32 Jajus what are they doing? Brother trust me, if I knew, I would tell you. Baron Thuland and his brother Michael were aghast as they watched the newcomer set up strange equipment in the backyard of the small mansion. Baron Thuland, we have completed our setup on the outside. It would be better if we were to have the meeting inside. All right, prepare the meeting room. Baron Thuland called the nearest servant, who then rushed ahead. After the preparation was done, Michael and Baron Thuland were staring into a large monitor. On the monitor was Christina's smiling face. Hey Michael. It seems that you finally got my message. Teacher? Is that really you? Yup, that's me. Damn, you really haven't changed in years. By the way, how are Maria and the kids doing? I've sent them as far away as possible from the war. I don't know how far they have gotten, but I have entrusted them with capable acquaintances. But enough of that. How am I speaking to you? I uh, can't tell you without the boss's permission. But he's busy now, so I've been entrusted with talking to you. Ah, uh, wait, where are my manners? Baron Thuland, it is great to finally meet you, though it's unfortunate that it is under these circumstances. Your brother has told me much about you during his adventures in the former Surinth Empire. Lady Christina, worry not. You saved my younger brother, and that is something that our family will never forget. But I must ask, why have you taken the risk to send people over just to check on us? My new master has obtained the loyalty of three former lords of the Surinth Empire, including me. We have plans to establish ourselves as a new country. It would make things much simpler if we were recognized by another country, such as the Kingdom of Hyme. But why us? I am but a lowly baron. You would need the queen. Baron Thulin began to trail off. You want me to introduce you to the queen? As expected that you would figure it out. But think of this as a simple trade. We will help you get rid of this civil war. And all your country would need to do is introduce us as the newcomer. But this will have to be done with the queen. For now, we need a reason to move our forces to meet with Her Majesty. Since we are not technically affiliated with any countries, we are nothing but a company that offers unique services. Would you like to hire us for anything? Michael was right to call you a scheming genius. Wait, brother, don't say that. Michael, did I hear that you were calling me something behind my back? An evil smile suddenly emerges on Christina's face. Baron Thuland realizes that he had accidentally said something he was not supposed to. Eh, uh, I would like to hire your company to act as guards as I march my army to assist Her Majesty, the Queen, in stopping the civil war. Baron Thuland, your order has been received. Unit 2222, your new orders are to escort Baron Thuland's army. The 24th platoon will relocate the base in this city. The experimental Shevler squad will be deployed. They will join you halfway. They will bring extra supplies and a new item. The relevant data will be sent over. Make sure all your units are updated on the plan. Orders acknowledged. What about the giants? The giants? The brothers shouted in unison. Ah yes, the giants. I'm sure you know that your prime minister has recruited the Vigner warriors and enslaved a clan of giants. They both nodded in reply. Well, they encountered an army of 200 and several giants who had sailed down to cause disruption along the supply lines. We have stopped them and captured their leader and several prisoners. Whilst the giants are recovering from their injuries and regaining their strength. What do you mean by cause disruption along the supply routes? It is as I say it. You are fighting someone who has insider knowledge of your tactics and weakness. Whilst you are fighting against an army that you have never fought against. 
I can confidently say that the main Hayami army is losing because all their strategies are compromised. In fact, I bet that there is probably an ambush waiting for you if you were to take the quickest route to the capital. What do you suggest we do then? asks Michael. Another smile appears on Christina's face. This time, it was for another reason. Michael, who remembered this type of smile, abruptly stands up. Brother, it's better if I was to leave now for you to strategize. I will coordinate with Gerald in procuring supplies for the journey, he says before exiting the room at speeds never seen before. Now, Baron Thuland, it's time for me to explain my elaborate plan. Outside the closed doors, Michael wished his brother good luck before he walked off to complete the excuse he had thought of in time. Duke Rainford was a prominent noble of the Hyami Kingdom, known for being a fair ruler. What bought his downfall was that he was too trusting. He was convinced to lead a small advance army towards the capital, but he was ambushed and killed. His head rested on a pole, carried by those who ambushed him as they lay siege to the city of Glanis, the city he once ruled. Isidola Rainford, the daughter of the duke, was the family's only surviving member. And to prevent her from being in danger or, worse, killed, the knight commander Scarlet placed her in a locked room, which only the knight commander herself was allowed to enter. But that was until the city began to fall. Soldiers were deserting left and right. Equipment would disappear or break but worst of all, no food and water. Supplies had stopped arriving for a while, and nobody knew why. On the other hand, the invading army was getting stronger and stronger. It was only a matter before the gate was breached, and the enemies swarmed into the city. But that was if everyone in the city had not already starved to death. Time was running out. 4. Chapter 33 Let's rewind a few days. The 22nd platoon had notified us that they had spotted an army of Vigner warriors and giants. So I ordered another platoon to be sent along with supplies and an experimental mortar to be tested in actual combat. Until the next update, I was in my office along with Elrond and Elora. A while ago, they came to me with a proposal to make some alcoholic beverages due to the lack of them within the base. It was hard for us to purchase alcohol because of the lack of stock. Its price had skyrocketed, so we decided to make our own. At the moment, we were tasting 11 alcohol, which was considered a high-value commodity. It was made by one of the other elves who worked as a winemaker back in their old village before it was destroyed. Whoa, this taste is addicting, I exclaimed. Though I didn't know what types of fruits were used, they went well together, which made me want to take another sip. I know, right? Our master winemaker is very dedicated to brewing this type of wine. Only the most dedicated were allowed to know its recipe, and her master was also a renowned winemaker. Really? Would she be okay to produce more of these? I'll be happy to set up an area for her to make alcohol. I'm pretty sure she would be quite happy too. But the type of fruit needed is hard to find and only grows in small quantities. Elrin said in disappointment. Wait, we can have the lab look at it, and see if they can do anything. I suddenly jolted up. Oh, that's a great idea. That artificial selection idea of yours worked wonders. Ah, uh, well, it wasn't my original idea. I'm just borrowing it, I said as I bought out a few bottles of alcohol from the mini fridge I had installed in my office. In the bottles, there were beer, cider, vodka, and whiskey. However, I was interrupted by Ayumi calling me on the emergency line. Supreme Commander, sorry to interrupt, but our raiders have picked up something flying towards our locations. Four F-16 have been scrambled and are prepared to intercept with force. Do we know if it is an attack? I asked. I have requested the spies to report, but they have nothing about a plan to attack. The F-16s are only a few minutes from the location. Please come to the command room. Okay, sure, I'm heading over there now. Command, this is Tempest. We are at the location. Radar is still picking something up, but there is nothing in sight. Mana levels are abnormal. Permission to use mana disruptor? Tempest, this is command. Permission granted. Copy that. A few combat aircraft have been fitted with a large mana disruptor rune that can disable magic in a 15 meter radius. It was a tried and tested weapon against creatures that required magic to fly. The four F-16s began to increase the distance between them, and the mana disruptor was activated. Immediately the surroundings started to distort, and a small ship appeared. It was a small wooden ship with a big jet engine attached to the back, but it was most likely running on magic as the ship began to nose dive towards the ground. This is Tempest. A wooden ship has appeared in the sky. 
Our disruptor has most likely affected the ship's system to fly and is currently two minutes away from impact. This is command. We can see it on screen. Please disengage the disruptor and allow the target to maintain flight. Use the speakers to communicate and request them to land. If they do not comply, use the disruptor again. Copy that. Tempest out. Surprisingly, the ship followed our instructions and landed at the newly built airfield inside the forest. I had Cobra helicopters at the ready and a hundred armed units for precaution, but it was all for naught. The crew of the flying ship, well, it was just a girl, and a talking sword. Ayumi went to greet her but had to pry her off the Cobra helicopter, something about wanting to take it apart, and discovering all its secrets. After that, they arrived at my office. As interesting as it was, the talking sword had to have a scabbard due to safety concerns. Since it didn't have a physical mouth, it could still talk. As soon as they entered my office, Ayumi began with introductions. Supreme Commander, Mercy of the Seven Mages, and Rico, a magic weapon, have arrived. Yup, you heard right. A sage. We have basically no information on any of the sages. The ones we have are all just rumors that made no sense at all. For example, the ones we have on Mercy say that she is actually an old hag who uses dark magic to keep herself youthful. If it was true, it also applied to her personality as I see nothing but a child acting like a brat in front of me. I had Alora, as well as two other units, beside me, as she could see the flow of magic within a person. She gave the nod to confirm that Mercy could be the real deal. Give me one of those flying metal boxes, and we will talk, she says whilst pouting and crossing her arms. My apologies. They contain military secrets, so we will not be able to gift you any of our equipment. We do have process goods that you probably have never seen before. Merci, I told you. No one will give you a secret weapon as a gift. Let's just take those goodies. No, I don't care about those. I want she suddenly stops having a mini outburst and starts sniffing around. Sniff, sniff. This smell. It can't be. Hey, Merci, you're gonna have to explain what you smell because I don't know if you remember. But I'm a sword. Shut it, Rico. Merci's words set shivers down my spine. Whilst Rico, the sword, stops his sarcastic remarks. You there, elf, tell me. Have you ever heard a vendor named Elrose? Eh? Old Elrose, he passed away during the attack. Wait, have you been to our village before? Elora asked. Hmm, I met him when he was still traveling. It was a few years ago if I remember correctly. Merci, your sense of time is terrible. Your last time meeting Elrose was 97 years ago, and you were drunk the entire time. Rico butted in. I told you to shut it, Rico. But man, he made the best wine in the world. It's unfortunate that he died. Is that the wine he was famously known for, I smell? Not exactly, I replied. The wine was made by one of his pupils. I haven't tried the original, but this is already amazing. I opened the mini fridge to bring out the only bottle we had, but it suddenly disappeared, along with all the other bottles of alcohol. I turned back around to see that Mercy had taken all the bottles and was drinking whiskey out of the bottle as if it was just water. W what the hell? This amazing burn and this taste. Tell me what is this, and where can I get more of it? Wait, you're not meant to chug the whole thing. I tried to stop her, but she simply teleported to the other side of the room. I was bamboozled at first, but then I remembered she was likely the real deal. Come on, don't be such a buzzkill. Plus, I just heard that I lost an old friend. Can't a young lady wash away her sorrows with alcohol? Young, are you sure about I couldn't even finish my sentence? All the wind had knocked out my lungs, and I fell to my knees. I involuntarily curled up whilst cradling my crown jewels. The surprise attack was driving me crazy with anguish. What I was feeling was the pinnacle of male body pain. Is that a white light I see? Is it my time already? 3. Chapter 34 When I woke up again, I was in my bed. The excruciating pain was no longer, but the experience would linger forever in my memories and nightmares. As usual, I called out to the two units standing guard outside my room to let them know I was awake. But to my surprise, Ayumi was the one who entered. Supreme Commander, I apologize for not being able to prevent that sage from harming you. But Lady Alora has dealt with her, and has asked me to report to you. Wait, Alora dealt with her? What did she do? Yes, she says that Mercy is now very cooperative, and is even willing to join our ranks. I was surprised that Alora managed to do something I didn't know was possible. Mercy's childlike attitude was something to be reckoned with. But to even make her willing to join us was something beyond. 
I rushed to the research lab, where Laura was barking out orders to Mercy like a drill sergeant, whilst Mercy was in tears writing something on paper. Um, Laura, what is she doing, and what the hell did you do to her? I asked. Oh, a bit of this and a bit of that. More importantly, whilst you were recovering, the 22nd platoon spotted the advance attack party's leader. Also, the giants are fighting against their will due to the slave collars placed on them. Since we had few details on how the slave collars worked, I asked Mercy to help us out nicely. Then why the hell is she in tears? Was what I wanted to shout, but I held back. My recovering crown jewels were on high alert, especially about Elora's scary expression. I looked back to see that what Mercy had been writing was all smudged because of her tears. She looked back at me with pleading eyes full of tears, but I pretended not to notice. So, how did you get her to help us out? I asked, knowing that I should tread lightly. Simple. I just said that we would not give her any more alcohol we make because of what she did, and she began bawling her eyes out. I figured our magic development team could use someone as knowledgeable and powerful as her to lead. However, I'm starting to think that her childish personality might be a problem. I was certain that Laura wanted Mercy to hear that last sentence, considering she basically shouted it. Mercy helped us on several projects on which we were making little progress. Most required high to rune magic, which none of our mage researchers knows. Rico, the magic sword, was also quite knowledgeable in combat-related rune magic. There are two main types of magic. The first is simple spell casting, where the user channels magic and casts the spell. The stronger the spell, the more mana it required. Rune magic, which we use the most, only needed to be written out and mana to activate. The high to rune magic was highly complicated, but with modern technology, it was easy to copy. The only problem was that it required lots of mana to activate, so we developed the silver mana batteries. I was very impressed at the sheer amount of knowledge the duo had. It would be foolish of me not to try and recruit them. At the end of the day, we discussed the work contract. Mercy was eager to get her hands on the elven wine and other types of alcohol. She would get a base salary which we would pay out at the end of every weekday, and most importantly for her, is to be able to purchase alcohol at a discounted price. I made sure to tell her that drinking on the job was not okay. If selling alcohol at a lower price could get us one of the strongest sages in the world then so be it. Rico, on the hand, was fine with money. I learned it was an artificial soul created by a highly advanced magic civilization hundreds of years ago. It had its own personality, which developed over time. My friend, if you have lived as long as we have, money is sometimes stronger than any other power. It had said with a laugh. Later that day, I had a meeting with the three lords to tell them about Mercy the Sage. It was safe to say they were surprised but happy to have someone as capable as her join. And that was how we managed to recruit an alcoholic sage and a talking sword. On the other hand, the civil war that broke out in the kingdom of Hyami was still progressing. The prime minister and his pro-war faction were slowly closing in on the queen and her peace-loving faction. So we needed to speed up our operation. I had leveled up once again, and I had another 200 units available. So I made another company of 100 units. Under Yumi's recommendation, I also created a squad of units specializing in melee combat. This squad was called the Experimental Chevalier Squad, but not only did they use melee weapons, but they were enchanted, courtesy of our duo of magic geniuses. The squad comprised six units, but these units were unique. During the few days they were activated, they began to form a personality and their own identity. We had the two shield wielders, nicknamed Titan and Demo. Titan preferred to hold ground, whilst its twin demo, short for demolition, liked to charge and demolish things. Their tower shields had many enchantments, such as physical and magical defense, but Titan's shield could create a magic barrier, whilst demo could shoot small explosion spells. They also had regular swords reinforced with dragon fang dust. The next pair had pole arms, a spear, and a glaive. The spear was wielded by Noble, a unit very serious about warrior's ways. Its spear could create lightning. The glaive could send blades of wind, which could easily slice through a person and cause a lot of damage. But the unit called Mute was the silent type and didn't talk much. The final two were different. There's Riot, who is kind of like the group's jokester. Pranks and annoyed people were everywhere it went. It wielded twin blades, which had magic that caused people to lose sight of it. To keep this group functioning, 
We needed a unit that could control everyone in the group. That's where Chief comes into play. As the squad leader, it had all the necessary skills to lead this group. But most importantly, the other units followed its command, even Riot. This squad and another company of units were dispatched to help speed up our mission. We need to get to the Queen before the Prime Minister does, or else we need to devise another plan. 2. Chapter 35 Flying through the night sky was a C-130 carrying the experimental Chevalier squad and a small platoon of units. They were sent as an advance party to verify information from merchant sources. Chief, we are five minutes from the LZ. Prepare to jump. After hearing the pilot, Chief, the leader of the Chevalier squad, got up to do some last-minute prep talks. You heard the pilot. Everyone weapons check. Newt, I want you to take the team of stocks and reinforce the main gate. Take this flag. It has the house of Thulin on it. Make sure they know that we are allies. The rest you're with me. We have unconfirmed information that several knights have revolted against the house of Rayford, and the castle is under attack from the inside. So our mission is to verify that information. Wait, where is Riot? Riot jumped a while ago when you had your back turned, said Noble, whilst cleaning its spear. And its parachute is still here. I sure hope Riot leaves some bad guys for the rest of us. It's time for us to show the commander what we are made of, says Titan. Someone's still mad about yesterday, points out Demo. That red serpent kill was meant to be mine, but Riot threw a grenade down its mouth, and it exploded everywhere. I was in the sanitation station for four hours to get rid of all the gunk. Well, at least you are nice and shiny for this mission. Now shut up, we're jumping. Remember, complete the missions. Hey, chief, it's your favorite unit, Riot. Suddenly came through the comms system. Riot, where the hell are you? Oh right, I'm in the castle you mentioned. Did you know the castle has a secret escape tunnel leading out to the garden? No, but wait, how do you know that? Said a concerned chief. I don't. I tried to ask this group of people nicely, but they attacked me, saying something like, wow, who the hell are you? Or stop moving, you're dead. So I tossed them all and wrapped them up nicely. One of my new friends here spilt the beans. They worked under that water knight, who had revolted against his now dead lord. It seems that the daughter, fire knight and earth knight are holed up on the top floor. The information was correct. We can skip to phase three of plan A. But uh, chief, it looks like I have some new friends here, so I'm gonna say hello. The comms go silent. Everybody looked at the chief to see how it'd react. Stop idling and jump. Tens of units began dropping from the sky. However, all the parachutes were the brightest colors making them easily spotted by the people on the ground. It was no doubt the work of the prankster. Captain, we cannot hold on any longer, and the door is about to be breached. Nonsense, we are knights, and we do not give up until we meet our end. We only need to hold on until Ivote has been notified of his cousin's betrayal. Scarlet, the famed knight of flames, shouted with a parched throat. She has been fighting with her fellow knight, Captain Yan, the earth knight, against the traitor who was once their comrade Mill the water knight. Here, drink some of this. Jan offers Scarlet a leather pouch full of water. How is Lady Isadola doing? She's surprisingly doing good despite the situation. Shows that she is definitely mature enough to understand the current situation. Scarlet looked at Isadola, who was staring out the window. Her attitude had changed massively since the news of her father's death. But it wasn't going to change the situation. Mihal's aim was to capture the daughter of the duke they once served and it was very likely that he was working with the Prime Minister. It was also possible he had a part in the ambush, which resulted in the death of their lord and their comrade, the Wind Knight. Scarlet had no idea if the message even reached Ivote, or if he had also betrayed them. Even then, she doubted they could hold on until reinforcement came. The only thing stopping the enemies was the heavy door, and the exhausted soldiers using their bodies to prevent it from opening. Suddenly the great panels of glass windows were smashed through, and five figures landed in the room. Through the windows, how? Stop right there, or else I will cut you down. Scarlet regained her composure, and drew her sword despite being taken by surprise. We are reinforcements on behalf of Baron Thuland. Chief pulls out a dagger with the Thuland family crest, and presents it to Scarlet to see. Are you Knight Captain Scarlet? That I am. What is your name, Knight, and how did you get in through the top floor? I am no knight, but I am simply called chief. And we jumped in from the sky. More importantly, is Lady Rainford here? Yes, she is, right over there. But we need to find a way to escape immediately. 
Mihil and his forces are right outside that door. Don't worry, we will take care of it. Take this bag. There is food, water and medical supplies. Leave more injured ones to me. Chief turns to face the rest of his team. Titan, I want your barrier up to protect the injured. Noble and Demo, you get to have the fun part while still begin emergency treatment. Understood. Everyone began to move the injured behind Titan, and treatment began. All units were capable of essential battlefield treatments for humans and units. But the more severe ones required proper medical units. Titan activates its barrier, which extends from its shield, covering everyone in the radius. Whilst Noble and Demo were waiting in front of the door. Finally, the door was smashed, and soldiers tried to funnel into the room. But Demo was blocking the way with its shield up. Hee hee, this is where the fun begins, exploded into million pieces. Demo's shield shot forward an explosive blast, sending limbs and bodies back outside. Noble then attacked from the side, killing soldier after soldier before they could even retaliate. Such lack of skills have you, people, not been training. Those weapons are wasted in your hands. Put them down before I make you. Noble said as it swiped off a man's arm and continued on its rampage until a spear of water appeared from its blind spot. HMH, such cowardly tricks. Something like that will never stop me. The water spear was easily dodged and slashed until it broke onto the floor like a mere puddle of water. It seems that you're quite proficient with that spear. What is your name? The one responsible for the water spear appeared from the back. I am Noble. What is yours? I am Mihil, and I challenge you to a duel to the death. Duel accepts. It's about time. I can feel the warrior blood flow through my circuits. And thus, a duel was initiated. All the fighting had stopped to watch the champions fight. If it was a regular duel between the two sides' leaders, whichever side loses, all surrender. But Mihil had no plans to play by the rules. Instead, he planned to play the dirty way. His sword was coated with a poison that caused immediate paralysis, and eventually, every organ would stop working. All that was needed was a single cut, and Mihil would win the fight, or so he thought. The two made a standoff waiting for the other to make the first move. But the first move never came. A single gunshot echoed, and Mihil exploded into a thousand pieces. Everyone stood aghast. Whoa, I did not expect that to happen. Maybe Mercy labeled this wrong? Appearing from what seemed to be nowhere was Riot. In its hand was a revolver burning so hot that it turned a golden color. Riot, why must you interrupt a duel between warriors? Shouted Noble. Cool your circuits. He was clearly going to cheat. There was poison on his blade and who knows what else he had planned. But still, this weapon is the definition of a war crime. Try that again, and I will ensure you will never play pranks on anyone again. Good luck with that. Oh hey, chief, how you doing? Riot, I don't even know what to ask first. Well, let me start. I found coded notes, and plans belonging to Mihal and his group. The code is quite simple, and I uploaded it to the database system. Most of the Mihal's goons are either dead or unconscious except for the ones here. Also, I have a gun that commits war crimes. Everyone in the room, ally and foe, was shocked at what looked like the most confusing situation they had ever been in. Meanwhile, Daniel was originally a mage for the Sorrent Empire, and then a prisoner of war. But now he was working as a researcher for the people who took him as a POW. Not against his will but as a proper employee, they also moved the rest of his family to a lovely new home close to his own apartment. Professor Mercy, I have the report from test 23. There seems to be a mistake. The explosion radius was the same but released a large electric current that shut down the test units around it. Reported Daniel. What? How did that happen? I must have written the wrong script. No, it can't be. Also, we can't find test 24, and the last name in the access log was yours, professor. No, 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 I'm so done for. Wait, where is it? I swear I placed it there before I left yesterday. Professor? Fine, I might have misplaced it, and I mixed the scripts up because I was drunk. You know I have to report this, Professor. Please, Daniel, you don't have to do this. It's a small mistake, I'm sure that it will turn up soon, and we can just rewrite the scripts. It's no biggie. It's not like someone died because of that mistake. Right. A few days later, when I heard about this incident, Mercy was given a weak alcohol ban. It was initially going to be two weeks. But considering Riot did take the weapon without proper permission and exploded a man into bits with it, that was not Mercy's fault. Riot was banned by Mercy from entering the lab from then on. 
5. Chapter 36. Sir Ivote, we lost 50 men today, but only 40 of them are either dead or injured. The rest, I'm afraid to say, have probably abandoned posts. Our supplies are not doing so good. The archers are low on arrows, and we have no spare weapons, a soldier reported. Hmm, this is the most unfortunate situation. Have we found any of the missing supplies? replied Ivote as he cleaned his weapon. No, sir, but there is something else. Someone would like to speak to you and you only. Who are they? They have the Thulin family crest, but they wear strange armor and carry weird weapons. H.M., I'm surprised someone from his house is here within the walls. Fine, I will meet them. Yes, sir, I will bring them over now. After the soldier left, Ivo was alone, back to cleaning his weapon. Nothing was on his mind except that he knew he might die soon. Against all odds, he had survived with a small, demoralized force for this long. But, sir, I have brought Sir Mute and his second in charge here. Mute, huh, that's an unusual name. Is it your real name? Mute walked closer to Ivote and nodded its head whilst showing the flag. As its name suggests, it didn't talk much. I guess you're not much of a talker, eh? Instead of replying, the other unit spoke up. We are mercenaries hired by Baron Thulant. We are a small advance force sent ahead to assist until the main army arrives in less than four days. How many men has he bought? Just under 1,000 soldiers and 500 from the militia. That's still not enough. 5,000 enemy soldiers are outside that wall, and more are arriving daily. How many able men do you still have? 800 on the walls. There should be another 300 still at the castle. My cousin Mill is one of the knight captains at the castle. I'm afraid to say that your cousin Mill had attempted to rebel and was put down by one of our operatives. Lady Scarlet has left Lady Isadola to Sir Yan, and she is heading over with her troops to assist. That can't be true the information shocked Ivote as he dropped the sword in his hand. I don't believe this. Mill devoted his entire life to getting to his position. It's true Ivote. Arriving at the door were Scarlet and the rest of the Chevalier squad behind her. Your cousin betrayed us and was killed for it. Your reaction seems like you had nothing to do with it. But we will talk later. Baron Thulin's mercenaries have information on the enemy. Overwatch has spotted large movement from the enemy camp. We likely need to prepare for a night attack, said Chief. Lady Scarlet. I vote look back to Scarlet with uncertainty. We can trust these people, I vote. Order your men and prepare the defense immediately. Yes, ma'am. I vote picked up his sword and rushed out of the room, along with the guards stationed outside the room. So, what are you guys planning on doing? Asked Scarlet. We will station most of our current forces on the walls whilst the smaller squad be outside the main gate, explained Chief. We have requested extra support, and they are on their way. I understand that you are all very capable, but the enemy force still outnumbers us. No worries there. We just need to delay them as long as possible. We will have all machine guns stationed around the gate, and when the time comes, we will retreat and let them take over. I do not understand what a machine gun is, but I trust you all to stay alive. I will take over the troops and make sure they do not interfere with your plans. Much appreciated. We also need to know any information on the enemy, like their weapons, formation, and if they have any long-range magic weapons. We don't know much, except they are mostly all Vigner warriors. I fought against the enemy leader during the last attack, and we drew. The others are probably troops sent by the Prime Minister's faction to keep an eye on them. We will have to make do with that much. All right, let's get set up, ordered Chief. As predicted, the night attack happened. The Vigner warriors did not expect the whole enemy force to be waiting and ready for them. Nonetheless, they carried on with the attack instead of retreating. They advanced in a compact shield formation to protect themselves from the volley of arrows. However, since they were so close together, the grenades were even more effective, killing over 20 soldiers each time. The attackers' only advantage was their numbers, but it was dwindling. Demo beat down soldiers and sent them flying in the air with his explosion shield. Noble and Newt dived into the middle of enemies, creating a blood storm. Riot had gone off and killed most of the enemy's commanders but kept those who looked important alive but incapacitated. Titan and Chief protected the units setting up a small machine gun bunker outside the main gate. As the fight continued, the Vickners reached one of the walls and prepared to climb on the ladders they had carried. Ladders! They're climbing up! Shouted an archer on the wall as he realized his quiver was empty. Clearing climbers now! replied the unit as it pulled out its sidearm and shot down at the enemies climbing up. Climbers cleared, 
continued to engage. A formation consisting of four AH-1 Cobras raced through the night sky over the city walls. Ground force, air support has arrived. Roger that, it's about time you guys joined the party. Be advised we have friendlies inside and on the walls. Keep fire to the outside. Understood commencing fire. An endless hail of gunfire sprayed across the land from one side to another, obliterating everything in the way. The enemies began to scatter like a swarm of fleeing spiders. Whether they had a shield or heavy armor, none of them could escape. Scarlet, who was on the wall, found that she couldn't speak and could only stare at the bloodbath. Her whole life, she had trained her magic and swordsmanship to prepare for any combat situation. Nothing in the world could prepare her for something on this scale. Perhaps if she knew sage-level magic, she might be able to stand against the flying iron monster and its whirling blade of death. After the swirling sound of the Gatling guns subsided, the battlefield became quiet. Only the loud propellers of the helicopters could be heard. Chapter 37 Monsters are one of the major causes of death in this world. They can spawn due to condensed mana or are born naturally from parent monsters. Officially there isn't a way to determine the danger level of a monster, as it varies for everyone. A simple village civilian may place a typical forest goblin at the top of the list, while a soldier, not including our units, may place it in the middle. And then there is someone like Mercy, where a goblin is not even on the list. So when villages encounter monster problems, sometimes they don't receive any support from the local lord due to the difference in threat perspective. Even if help is sent, it could take days, possibly weeks, to arrive. By then, it could be too late. There was once a village that was under attack by a single orc. The local lord, a military veteran, thought the villagers could take down the orc, so he did not send any soldiers. Some time after, the single orc had created an army of hundreds of orcs and destroyed city after city. The death toll was estimated to be in the thousands. We decided to station small security forces in villages far from military bases or towns. That way, any threats could be responded to immediately. This was decided due to the abnormal increase in monster activity. We learned that packs of wyverns had been spotted, causing significant damage around the former Surinth Empire lands. So we placed the air force on high alert by increasing air patrols and more ground-based surveillance radars. Wyverns are viewed as a flying disaster. Swords are ineffective against something that can fly at extreme heights. The only effective way to take down a wyvern is to remove its capability to fly with long-range mages and magic weapons. Then the melee troops can finish it off. It was the most effective way, but it could lead to high casualties. Even though we had fighter aircraft, we still needed to be careful as most of our current weapons are meant to be against an enemy at the same technological level. Monsters were never included as an intended target during the design process of these weapons, so one of the main focuses is developing weapons with monsters as one of the targets. Speaking of countermeasures, we also had to increase our intelligence and counterintelligence capabilities. With the increase of refugees coming into our cities, it wouldn't be a surprise to find a dozen or so spies hiding. A special department called the Department of Security and Intelligence, or DSI, was created, and its main focus was to collect foreign intelligence and counterintelligence. Our latest arrest was a duo. Though it wasn't the DSI who caught them, it was actually the newly created 4th Battalion stationed in Christina's territory. The base had perimeter security cameras with inferred and night vision capabilities. The cameras had already picked up the intruders when they got a few meters close to the fences. We decided to proceed with activities, as usual, to find out what they were after. But that was until they attempted to take down the two units guarding the weapon storage, so the intruders had to be subdued and brought back to the main base to be interrogated. I had plans to watch the interrogation to properly understand the process, and maybe because I was getting bored reading reports and using my phone to create supplies. We need some more entertainment, something like video games or TV shows. But that would require many people like actors, scriptwriters, etc. Maybe the units could fill those roles. Oh, well enough thinking. I prepared all the things I needed and walked out of my office. My two bodyguard units followed closely behind me. The interrogation room was going to be the prison, which was quite empty. We still held a few captive from the war, as most prisoners had been ransomed off or had begun working for us. After they were brought to the prison, the first person was brought to the interrogation room and his hands were chained to the table. The spy looked about in his early thirties and had the build of someone who had seen some combat. 
We confiscated an identification card that granted entries to one of the major cities in the Western Union called Rembuk, but we presumed that it was naturally fake. He also carried two small daggers and a tiny bottle of what we assume is poison. We aim to identify which country or organization he and his companion are working for and their objective. But as accepted, he didn't say anything except swear at the interrogator. His partner was also the same, not a single word. But something didn't sit right with me. The first spy had a plain look with no distinct features, which is quite helpful for a spy to be forgettable. On the other hand, the second one was a handsome young blonde man, probably around my age, who was not forgettable. I turned to the unit that was managing the recording and camera systems. Is the anti-magic system on right now? I asked. No, Commander. Maintenance has found issues with the system when it has been on for a long time. So it has been temporarily switched off until repaired, and security has been doubled temporarily. I thought about the next course of action and then exited the room. My two bodyguards are always fully armed and equipped with nearly everything. That included an anti-magic grenade. I opened the interrogation room door and threw in the anti-magic grenade. It rolled under the table, and a small shock wave shook the room. I was told the shock wave is the mana being pushed out of the area, which is how it prevents magic from being used. The spy looked at me, confused, until he realized I was looking at his now glowing ears, and his expression turned dark. So you're an elf. So what? Why are you working with that human spy? Why should I tell you that? Because I have an idea of what you are looking for. Tell me, did you belong to the elven village in this forest? As I mentioned the village, he stood up and slammed his hands against the table, clearly in rage. You bastard, did you do that to my village? No, no, no. I didn't do that. It was the work of the minotaurs that destroyed your village. Minotaurs, where are they right now? I will kill every single one of them. We've killed them all already. As I said that, the look of revenge disappeared as was replaced with sadness. Were there any survivors? Before I tell you anything else, I want you to tell me everything about that other guy. I said as I sat in the interrogator's seat. His expression turned angry and annoyed initially. But then he calmed down almost immediately. Fine, I'll tell you everything I know about him. The elf began to explain. I don't know his real name, but I think I know who he works for. Really who? The spider. The spider? I don't think we've heard of them before. Please tell me more. If you look at the roof of his mouth, there should be what they call the mark of the spider. They specialize in all sorts of dirty work as long as there is money. So that means someone has hired them against us. That's right. He approached me with an offer. If I helped him to sneak somewhere, he would tell me who destroyed my village. But I guess I don't need to help him now. Did he mention what he was looking for? Not directly. I overheard him talking to someone at a bar when I followed him. It was likely his boss, and they mentioned things from weapons to finding the leader. Any idea who this boss is? Nope, couldn't see them, or else they would have seen me, but I am sure it was a woman's voice. That's all I know. Now tell me what I want to know. Just as he finished, a unit entered the room. Supreme Commander, as per your orders, Elrond and the others have arrived. Elrond? said the elf. That's right, Elrond and some others are the only survivors of the village we know. Now follow the unit. They will take you to them. Are you sure? Yes, why? I mean, I was arrested for spying, trespassing and tried to attack one of your soldiers. Now you're just going to let me go. Not exactly. I will let Elrond know of this and have him punish you. Does that seem fair? Not really. I'd rather stay in a cell than Elrond's punishments. He joked. My name is Algar, by the way. I currently do not have a name, though I should probably give myself one, as it's getting inconvenient. No name? Why? I'll tell you all about it later. Now go. Elrond and the others are waiting, and we haven't told them why they're here. I saw Algar off before calling for another round of interrogation for our only spy. The aim was now to find out who hired them. 